Let's go for the final part of today's shows. We are here in Ulu, Finland, for the lead finals of the UIAA Ice Climbing World Youth Championships and the Senior European Cup. Over the course of the show, we'll be crowning an under-19 champion, an under-21 champion, and, of course, the European Cup winner for Ulu and the overall European Cup winner for 2023. So get comfortable and strap in for an action-packed couple of hours as we kick off the proceedings with the under-19. And we will be starting with this start list with the under-19 final with Daniel Kokoschka, Tio Helasvio, Pairi Bjork, Jakob Volvent, Konstantin Vili, Jorge Vieja Rodriguez, Tim Ziegler and Rory Watson. We will then have the uh, females with Nessa McShannon, Vivian Reinders, Ronya Kyler, Kasia Ogilvy, Vilja Helen, Rosa, Rosa Arnold, Tilda Quickenwerter and Lorena Beck. So I am joined today by Ryan McCauley from Team USA. You came fourth in speed in SASFE. Thank you so much for joining me. Excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, that is okay. So this is the first time we actually get to see um, this part of the lead wall. Um, so the men and women will be climbing on two different parts of the lead wall, but they will both be going up that impressive overhanging structure, which is built on an old crane. <laughs> so first glance, what do you make of it, Ryan? Wow, that looks steep. It looks like it's going to be an exciting one to watch. And I know you had talked a little bit too about the time differences, which I think will be really interesting to see. It sounds like a lot of people topped out um, for some of the youth ones earlier. So interested to yes. see what that looks like. Yeah, me too. It's um, I'm not 100% sure why they've done it, but the women are getting seven minutes and 30 seconds, uh, whereas the men will only get seven minutes. So that means if the timer runs down while an athlete is still on the wall, then they will get the points for the position that they are at at that point. Um, they will not get to attempt to get to the top, even if they could do it. Um, so that is where we're at. <laughs> it looks like they're just pulling the ropes through and getting ready for those first athletes. Um, what would be going through your mind at, at the moment if you were an athlete here? Well, with the route preview, a big part of what you want to go out and look for is kind of looking for those crux moves or any kind of holds you aren't maybe familiar with or uh, are hard to identify. And so I think really processing like things that I'm not so certain about, um, maybe talking to other athletes and, and thinking about what their strategies are for some of those harder moves. So especially with that overhung route, I don't want to waste a ton of time um, with that kind of angle. I want to be able to move through as smoothly as possible. So that's probably what I'd be thinking about is like, how can I be as speedy as possible there? <laughs> yes, yeah, save your energy. <laughs> Just don't, don't burn out on that overhanging section. <laughs> Oh, totally. Yeah, it looks like we need to clip 11 on that overhanging section, but I'm not sure if that's the men or the women's route at the moment. Um, there, we're getting a really good close-up of one of the, I think that's a metal hold, is it? Um, oh, um, yeah. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it does look like that. Um, really curious to see more about where that's placed in the route. I'm going to be really curious to see how they get across that really elongated barrel um, and what they're allowed <laughs> to use which parts of, <laughs> they're allowed to use of that barrel that's going to be really interesting um so is generally on a um a world cup or a, a world championships like this have they got an area where they can warm up like what's the process before they actually come out for something like this oh man that's such a great question i think it can really vary depending on the location um Sometimes there will be a really solid warm up wall, which I think as an athlete, I try to plan for that not to be the case. So I'm always pleasantly surprised if there is something like that. Um, and <laughs> even if there is a really good warm up wall, it might be really small. So thinking really strategically about, OK, well, you know, who else is going to be using it? Do I have a time box? Um, oh, and it looks like we're going. It looks like we have started with Nessa McShannon. So we're starting on the women's route. Um, 
yeah, feel free to finish what you were saying. Um, <laughs> we can catch up with Nessa um, at any time. I'm sure she's going to make it through a long way. Yeah, uh, but with the, the warm-up balls, especially if it's outdoors too, I think that can play a whole different uh, mind game too of just staying warm. I know I've heard historically that Finland has been a very cold venue. So thinking about mm. are there areas I can go to warm up inside? Um, are there other ways that I want to be able to bring my own resources like stretchy bands or things to make sure that I'm able to warm up if I get there and there isn't a solid warm up wall? Um, so something definitely to take into account as I'm preparing to climb. Mm, that's really interesting. So you, you don't necessarily know what you're arriving to. So you have to actually bring your own things with you just in case. <laughs> Yeah, and I've even talked with other teammates who sometimes will have very creative ways of warming up or, or stretching out like their shoulders. Um, and uh, it you may look like a little silly kind of waving your arms around or doing different things, but um, it is possible. I know in last year, the North American Championships at URA, I'm just like running up and down stairs even because there is a very small warm-up ball and it can be very cold. So um haven't been to Finland and can't speak to their warm up structure, but just knowing how cold it can be and how it's outside, outside, um, I think mm. being prepared with backup plans just in case. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it it looks like the, the women's wall is going to be um, on on the left, on the slightly less overhanging, and the men's is going to go right through that incredibly steep overhanging section. So we'll see where the women end up. I'm sure there will be some overhanging bits in their route as well. But um, the, yeah. oh, Nessa has come off. So she has come off at clip number three and hold number 11. So she is currently in gold medal position. That's what it is showing on the right hand side. Uh, we'll keep talking about the graphics and what they mean as the competition goes on. Um, but that was a great start for the GB athlete, uh, Nessa McShannon. Yeah, she looks very confident there. Oh, that clip was yeah. a bit hard. Thanks. It does look quite tricky to get that clip, doesn't it? But then, is it this one? She just, yeah. There, yeah. she loses her axe. Just can't. Well, you can't carry on if you've only got one axe. <laughs> uh, so that is not Nessa McShannon. Um, that is looks like a male athlete from Finland. So I'm just <laughs> going to open up the men's. So that is uh, apologies. It's Daniel Kokoschka from Poland. Uh, I saw the blue top and assumed it was Finland. <laughs> Sorry, Daniel. Uh, so this is the first time we're going to get to see the men's route, um, which does go up and over that incredibly overhanging section. Um, it's always interesting to think about the holds on these volumes, too. I think that that can come into play as you're thinking about kind of the angle that you want to place your pick or the direction that you mm -hmm. want the, the beak of your pick facing. Because a lot of times, too, with volumes, if you're not careful, if you hook it one way, and then kind of move through it, it can be easier to kind of cam yourself off. Um, so uh, I think that that can add additional um, strategy into how you're climbing them. And thinking about your feet yeah. too, I know a lot of people will have different kinds of crampons on the bottom of your boot, depending on volumes on the route, because it allows you to kind of step on them in a different, more secure way. Okay, that's interesting. And I was also, just because he, is at a volume at the moment. Um, I remember in SAS face, some of the volumes, um, the athletes were really struggling to actually kick into them because they were actually made of something different. So I suppose that comes into play as well. You've got to try and guess or, or know from the look of them whether you're gonna be able to kick into the, does that count as a fall or not? I think he's wondering too. <laughs> oh, no, he's not being allowed to carry on. So Daniel Kokoschka gets to hold number seven, clip number one. Um, so although he's in gold medal position at the moment, we do expect that to change quite quickly. <laughs> uh, this is a replay um, of him falling. So we will go back to the women's now, um, which means we should have Vivian Reinders up next from Finland. Um, 
she's probably a little bit surprised um, that she needs to be ready just yet. So <laughs> um, she, we might have a small gap now. Vivian did climb this morning in the uh, speed championships. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see some of our athletes did compete in speed and some of them didn't. So uh, some will be a little bit fresher than others, but you could argue that they haven't had as much warm up time. <laughs> yeah. I do appreciate how the UIAA shifted around the way that they did kind of the scheduling or um, the timing that all the athletes would go. Um, previously, it wasn't kind of a set time to aim for. And so now things can move faster, but you don't have to necessarily start before the posted time that you're scheduled to go. And it gives you a better sense of how much time you have to warm up, how much time you have until you need to be ready. And if athletes are falling off faster than expected, um, it doesn't force you to, to have to be on the wall sooner. Um, so that's something that's been newer this season. And I really appreciated it, having a good sense of, okay, I can warm up within this box and make sure I'm not gonna be super rushed or behind schedule. That's really interesting. So they're given a start time that they can choose to wait until that start time. They don't have to just go as soon as sort of their um, their slot is open. That that was my understanding when, when we were competing uh, for the World Cup season. Um, and before that hadn't been the case. You had had kind of the, the start list um, and it, it was a little bit more open-ended um, and not always clear of what kind of timing um, to expect mm. and so having to pay a lot more attention to who's going um, and obviously still important because um, a lot of times things will continue to move ahead even if they're a little bit on pace and, and it's probably more uh, frequent that it might be moving a little bit behind but um, that was a, a change that they made I think according to feedback. Oh, and it looks like they're fixing a hold or something. Yeah, I just got a message through that there's been a tech incident on the men's, which is actually why. We're... Oh, yeah, you can see. Did you see the hold just came flying oh, off goodness. from that? So I wonder if he's going to be allowed to climb again. I assume he will because it came off as he pulled on it. Um, but for now, anyway, we are going to crack on with the women's. Um, so we will let you know what's going on um, in the men's competition as soon as we know. Um, but for now, we are cracking on with women. So it's Vivian Reinders, who came eighth this morning in the speed finals, um, and currently is sitting in eighth in the women's lead. But no doubt that will change as she makes her way up the wall. Looks like she wants to start off a little bit more confident on the holds. You can see her kind of wiggling her pick to make sure that it's solid yeah. before moving forward. There must be a very fine limit between wiggling to, to get confidence and wiggling and it just comes off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the hope is that if, if that's the case, that you'll, you'll know that before you fully weight it. Um, but yeah, a little <laughs> bit of a, a balance between wanting to get a sense of the hold and also move quickly. Um, without falling off, of course. <laughs> yeah, because of course, moving quickly is part of the game because if you do get to the same hold as somebody else, then the person who gets there fastest takes the, that position. Um, yeah, which sounds like it's coming to play a lot more than typical <laughs> from what I've heard here. Yeah, certainly so far today, um, it really played a very, very big part in the men's competition. Um, lots of the under 16 men actually topping the route, uh, which meant that they then had to use the times um, that each of the guys got to the top. So a really massive factor in this morning's competition. So we'll wait and see if it becomes a factor in this one because we're only on our second female so far. Um, just struggling to get that style in, but she's yeah. got it now, looking really super. That's a great close-up of her kicking into the wall. <laughs> oh, nice, yeah, I love that. Interesting how she like really moved down. She was in first position and then kind of went to second and then slowly worked her feet up and so delicate of a balance to be able to continue to pull down on that first hold and make sure that you 
you don't pop off of that by going too high, but needing to get high enough to get to the stein. So finding that balance there with her feet and um, with how she's holding her tools. Yeah, really, really great footwork from uh, Vivian at that point. This looks like quite a tricky move. That's We've not seen this yet because she has now overtaken uh, Nessa McShannon. So these are all new holds and new moves that we're seeing. <laughs> now on these smaller holds, are there any, generally, are there any sort of divots and holes or are they quite flat on the top? So it was interesting, I was just looking at that, um, the rock uh, hold that you can see that she had just moved out of. And I believe those are smart rocks, which have, there are a variety of them and they have different angles. And some of them have divots that are better than others, um, ranging mm -hmm. from like a, a pretty good divot to it being completely flat. And so it is something that even if you recognize the hold, sometimes it does take a minute to kind of figure out, okay, is this going to be as solid as I want or is it a bit flatter? Um, mm. And so, and like some of these more like plastic or resin ones can also have a divot or be flat. And if you haven't seen it before, then that's part of where she might be wiggling her pick just to see like, is it gonna slide into a divot? Like it feels good right now, but maybe if I get that little wiggle, and there is a divot there, it could slide in and kind of settle before I really fully weight it. Um, so some of them you might recognize, but uh, it, it can vary too also on where the holds are from, where your training facilities are typically. Um, and so that that's why sometimes the athletes will kind of test it before moving on to it just to, to make sure it feels secure. That's amazing. So yeah, you really don't know until you're you're on it and you're sort of waiting it a little bit that you know that you've actually got the, the divot or the slot or, or that there isn't one. <laughs> and South Korean holds, I think, are ones that are typically known to have um, kind of like one divot or spot that your, your tool goes in very nicely. And so if you've climbed on them before, um, some of them, like a Christmas tree shape or something like that, you might know where the divot is. Um, but I know teammates who have been in finals and just weren't familiar with the hold and, and didn't know where the divot was. So it either took extra time or they even fell just because it was something that was unfamiliar. So oh, definitely wow. an advantage if you're familiar with some of those holds. Yeah, yeah. And we should point out um, that although this is a Finnish athlete climbing on a Finnish wall, the setting has actually been done by a Korean um, setting team. So they might not necessarily be used to the sorts of moves and, and the style mm. of the climbing uh, that, that, that they've put on. Um, so it's not always an advantage to be at your home wall. <laughs> it can be if your home center is also there, but um, yeah. not, not always. <laughs> and that's tricky, you so, can kind of see her moving on the lower hold as she's going up. So something that can definitely be very delicate. Yeah, and at one point, I'm not sure if she was still holding it backwards, but at one point she was holding her ax backwards on that lower hold. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, we call that reverse like, grip. Right, which, reverse grip. Yeah, which can be really valuable at times to make it like a bit more of a anatomically natural movement. Um, so you're not like fighting your body to go to the next place and kind of saving energy, but sometimes moving through, um, you just have to be, oh no, especially careful with the, the direction. Oh, I hope we see a replay of that. I'm not really sure what happened there. I mean, she's clearly only got one ax. Maybe she just dropped the ax, but she got to 7.2. Um, and you could just see in one of the previous shots that the men have started to climb at the same time. Um, so we now have um, our men's athlete. Uh, let me just make sure I'm telling you the right name. Uh, that is Teo Helasvu from Finland. 
So here's a quick yeah. replay lower down um, on her route, but maybe we'll see a replay of higher up. We will wait and see. Yeah, there's that reverse grip that she did have it briefly. I really can't work out what happened there. It it kind of seemed like while she was going up, oh, oh, oh. man. <laughs> while she was Falls going up to that higher around. hold, <laughs> yeah, couldn't tell if her, her pick popped off first or her foot, but um, yeah. it seemed that she lost a bit of her balance there and then um, wasn't able to hold on to the, the left tool. Yeah, it all just seemed to sort of happen at once, didn't it? Um, and then we now have Teo also falling. So he's made it to clip two by the looks of things. I'm not sure which hold. I'll just try and work that out because it's not come up on the scoring yet. Um, have a look at my route map. And then we will be starting with, ah, so here we go. He made it to hold 10, perhaps. And clip three, apologies, I didn't see clip three, I only saw clip two. So, not sure if we're going to now start with a female or a male athlete. Um, if we're starting with a male athlete, it will be Pyrie Bjork. If we're starting with a female athlete, it will be Ronja Kyler. Uh, Ronja being from Finland. Um, And she competed this morning in the speed and came fifth. Uh, so yes, we are gonna start with Ronya. Um, so uh, all bar two of our female athletes actually competed in the speed this morning. The only two that didn't are Ogilvy Kasha and, uh, sorry, Kasha Ogilvy and Nessa McShannon. Um, all of the other athletes did compete this morning in speed as well. So, um, all equally tired, equally excited, <laughs> equally uh, endorphin fueled. <laughs> Looks like she's competing on South Korean tools as well, which I think is always fun to look at and see which tools people are using. You can see they're a little bit more curved down, which gives you an advantage because you can go a little bit higher up um, from first position to second to even third position. And it doesn't change the angle of your pick as much as some of the other tools out there like Xtreme say you don't really want to go into third position because it's going to pull your pick out at a, a starker angle. So just for the folks at home that aren't ice climbers, what do you mean by third position? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So first position is when kind of you're grabbing at what looks like the handle, the bottom of it. Um, and then second position, you're going up kind of above that pommel or angle, uh, sorry, handle, um, right where her right hand is right now. So that's second position, you're just above that kind of main handle. And then third position would be kind of like the next step up. So you're getting closer to the top of that tool. And so depending on how uh, sharp the, the curvature of your tool is, the higher up on the tool, um, can mean that you, if you are not right up against the wall with your, you actually can kind of uh, twist the position and the, the pick kind of starts to, to pull away from the wall, um, which you don't want. Um, it, it makes it so that it's much more likely to pop off those holds. But as you can see with those tools, they are a bit more hooked than some other tools. Mm -hmm. And so going from second to third, so a slightly higher, um, doesn't actually pull out from the wall as much. It pulls down I see. a little more. So why might an athlete not choose to have ones where you can use third position? Yeah, um, I think that because that is such a kind of curved angle, it takes a bit more getting used to um, when you potentially are used to climbing on something like extremes or anchars out of Russia, um, then you have a bit more length um, down below where you can maybe match your hands in the kind of handle or first position. Um, and you might be just more comfortable without such a drastic angle. Um, 
because they will feel really different and they do take a lot of getting used to. So if you haven't used them a bunch or they're just not what you're comfortable with, um, mm. it is something that people just have different preferences on what they like using for the different holds. Yeah, I, that makes perfect sense. I mean, we all have a preference of what trainers we use to go running in. So why not <laughs> something as technical as an ice axe as well? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, we just saw some amazing footwork and sort of technical moves as uh, Kyla made that huge reach up um, to the right. Um, looks like a sort of, I'm going to call that one a mini crux. Doesn't look like the full crux, but it definitely <laughs> looks like a slightly cruxy section. <laughs> um, so it looks like we've got our next male tie again as well. Um, so the men and women are going to climb at the same time. We will do our best to keep you updated with, with where they all are. But for now, we, we will stick with Ronia Kyler. Uh, the next male tying in is Pyrie, Pyrie Bjork from Finland, um, who you can see on the top left of your screen at the moment in the um, inset picture. Um, so the graphic on the right hand side, that's going to stay live with the women at the moment um, because that's who's taking up the main part of the screen. If that changes, we'll let you know. So Ronya has just gone into gold medal position. She is at clip seven and hold 20. Um, so she has gone into first place. Looking really very strong on that Stein. Yeah, and it uh, looks like her, <laughs> her pick was just very slightly angled to the right. So I was curious how secure that was going to be, but it's looking like it, it hasn't held her back there. Yeah, a little stumble, a heart in the mouth moment, but uh, <laughs> it looks like it, she's found the best position for it after that. She tried to match it yeah. when she tried to get the left hand axe in. It just it didn't work. She's and this struggling looks like a, a big move, age. yeah. Some of those bigger okay, Stein so moves are are tricky. You want to really be powerful, and and um, mm. you have to like move up really quickly to kind of get your weight up above your hips and onto your toes, so that you can effectively grab that next hold. And you want to try and do it quickly as much as you can. Otherwise, you're you're kind of fighting your body to get up to the position where you can reach the next hold. Right, so you have to be really powerful in your legs, in your hips, um, as well as in your arms. Yeah, it's this balance of trying to move your feet up so that when you do stand up, you have more of that reach. But the higher your feet are, the more you have to kind of fight your body to get that core up. Mm. Ah, oh, just doesn't quite make it. So Kyla uh, gets to clip eight and hold 21. So she's currently in first place in the women's. Um, I believe uh, Pyrie is still on the wall for the men. So we don't have a position for him at the moment. Um, but hopefully we will get back to the action with him very shortly. So here we go. Pyrie making his way onto the steepest part of the men's route. Looks like he has got clip three. Um, I now can see where clip number three is that we couldn't see before because it was behind the uh, Teo's leg um, when we were watching him. Gosh. I was, I was going to say, it's going to be impressive if he gets out of that position. <laughs> Everything yeah. got in a bit of a tangle there, didn't it? <laughs> that was a little bit tricky. It looked like the last athlete was trying with a figure nine to kind of move over. This one trying to just see if it makes sense to, to break free. But then you've 
got to be able to really pull yourself into a figure four. Otherwise, you're going to waste a lot of energy hanging there. So looks like a, yeah. a balancing move to get out there. Yeah, that really does look pretty tricky. And um, yeah, he just got himself a bit tangled in the ropes and, and then ended up on one arm. Obviously, it is possible to get out of uh, a one arm move. We've seen it in comps before. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but that takes some strength and it, it did just look like he lost his axe. So um, he is on equal points with Teo at the moment, uh, the 3.1. Sorry, so that means he got to uh, clip three and hold 10. Um, so our next two athletes in the female, we will be starting off with um, Kasha Ogilvy. Uh, will that be our next female? And our next male will be uh, Jakob Volvend. Jakob, of course, uh, competing this morning um, and But Kasha did not compete this morning. Always fun um, trying to so, keep all of your layers on right until the very last moment there so you don't get too cold. <laughs> and then you have a set amount of time to get started. So kind of trying to pull them all off without messing up your gloves and everything. It's always Oh, wow. <laughs> so once you come out into the arena, you, you've got a set amount of time before you actually have to yeah, get your hands on the axes. Yeah, and so you really want to be as ready to go as possible when you come out because you want to be able to tie in, make sure that you have kind of made eye contact with the, the layer, you're ready to go, um, and have your gloves on. Um, I've I've known like teammates that have come out and, and been a little bit flustered and they're, the clock starts and they may not be ready oh, to climb. Oh. And so... <laughs> Um, wanting to make sure that you are ready kind of within that minute timeline of getting out there. Wow. Yeah, so um, they can start. It's just that their time is already starting to run out. Yeah, they they just lose a little bit of time on the wall if they're not ready to go in the first minute there. So not ideal since time can be so precious. Absolutely. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, so, uh, Kasha, this is her first year in the under-19 categories. Um, last year, she did um, compete in the under-16s, um, and she has also competed this year in Champagny and came 26th in the seniors in Champagny. So, be beginning to make her mark on the world tour. And confusingly, most of our um, under-19 athletes are actually 16 um, because, of course, the category underneath that is under 16. So as soon as you turn 16, you're uh, thrown in to the older age category. Um, so she is one of our 16-year-old competitors and has just bounced herself into bronze medal position for the time being. But let's see if she can get even further up the wall. As we get through these athletes, um, they they have come out in reverse order. So the athletes that got the highest yesterday will be coming out last. Um, so we would hope to see each athlete overtake the last, but you never know uh, what's going to happen with a competition like this. I think that's so interesting to think about age in these where I, I would imagine that it, it is a different head game. I didn't compete uh, when I was in the youth category, but to think about competing with people maybe three years older than you when you're a youth, mm. I, I think that would be just a, a different um, factor in kind of the preparation, the mental game potential stress and at the same time could be a, a really great experience to be able to go in with a healthy mindset. So if you continue to compete into when you're an adult, I think get a lot of really good experience. 
to improve, but I, I think that that would be really challenging. I think about where I was when I was 16 and I, I think those kinds of age gaps made a, a big difference to me at that time. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And in the men's, we do have a, as big as an age gap as you can have within an age category. So we've got some climbers who are 15 because they're going to turn 16 this year um, and some athletes who are 19 because they've turned 19 this year. So it's a four year age gap, um, sort of, <laughs> in the um, men's under 19 category. And so much can happen. You know, you can grow so much in that time. Um, I, I was talking earlier about the height differences between some of the climbers. It, oh it's, gosh, yeah. yeah, it's incredible. Um, and the root setters do an incredible job setting for that diversity as well. Um, yeah. Because That's of course we will such sit, a hard task. Coming. <laughs> yeah, such a hard task. Because uh, like, I believe the adults are going to climb the same route. Um, so the ones taking part in the European Championships are going to climb as well. So you've got 15 year olds all the way through to sort of 30 year olds um, competing yeah. on this route. So I mean, I think about some stuff. of the moves we've seen so far, like being stretched out like that on the men's route, trying to get around that volume or like the big mm -hmm. Stein moves for the women, even the, the one happening right now on the women's route, like those can be very height dependent and you'll have to just do them in a different way. Think more strategically yeah. about your feet. Um, but yeah, that's a big difference. And, and to your point, I think with training and with, what your body is able to like take on with training and what you need to be able to stay healthy and like in terms of nutrition as you're growing, I think it can look really different for Def a four year age gap like that. Yeah, absolutely. Your training load and also what you're experiencing at school and, um, you know, whether you're going through uh, exam periods or not, because obviously through the different ages, you have a different mental load as well. Um, so, yeah, these athletes are all going through very different things, but they're competing on the same world stage and on the same route. So it's yeah, it's interesting to see what they manage to achieve. Um, Kasha is about to hopefully um, go into first place on the women's route um, and Jakob Volvent on the men's route um, is just getting to the same point where everybody else has fallen so far. So let's see if he can get a little bit further um, and put himself into gold medal position. Of course, because of his qualification, if he gets that hold, which he does, he will, whoop, commentator's curse, uh, <laughs> he will move into gold medal <laughs> position. Anyway, just because of his qualification, <laughs> but he's not actually got it just yet. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop cursing you. Sorry, Jacob. <laughs> there we go. So he does move himself into, oh, I think that might have been a full fall. Yes, it was. So he also like gets a... three points. Ooh. It does seem like a really, really big powerful move that one it'll be interesting to see how it's done when it does get done eventually yeah, it's just hard from that uh, vantage point to see if your pick is is in that hold the way you want it mm. to be like there it's not actually in but it looks like it's on the backer plate enough to kind of feel like you have some security there until you wait it and, and realize it's not where you want it to be absolutely yeah even from where we were sat it it did actually look like it was on properly. <laughs> I was sort of thinking, oh, this is it, right? So we're going to see how it's done. But nope, that popped off. So we are back on the women's route with um, Kasha. Looking a little tired now, a bit of a shake of the head, a bit frustrated by another big move, it looks like. <laughs> And that is her timing out. So she has uh, reached clip number nine, hold 22. So she is currently safely in gold medal position. Do you think, well, actually, you will know. Do you know um, how your fellow competitors have done <laughs> when you're sat in isolation? Do you have any oh, idea no. how well? 
When you're in isolation, it is interesting because, yeah, you are not able to see how other people are climbing the route. You're not able to, to hear how well people are doing, how far they're getting. You might be able to kind of infer things if, yeah, if they're calling people through really quickly. Like in Sasuke mm -hmm. for men's finals, I know there was one move that took out a lot of men, I think, earlier than expected. And so it moves through a lot faster. So I'd imagine if you're in isolation, you're thinking, oh, gosh, like what's going on? Why why are people going through so quickly? It doesn't seem like they're taking the full time. Um, but mm -hmm. you may not know where the, the move is, even if you're kind of guessing that there's some kind of stop or move. You don't know. It's like I think people have have kind of jokingly said like, oh my gosh, they're in first place. Like, and if it's semifinals, you know, they can pop off right now and save their energy for finals, but there's no way that they would know that. And so having to kind of still put in your best effort, go as far as you possibly can and, and hope that it's good enough. Um, and you don't know until you're down and you're able to then look at the scoreboard and then you can watch other people after you climb if, if there are other people still competing. But yeah, it's, mm. it's really, um, I think you have to kind of separate yourself from what you think has happened and, and just climb your best and, and hope that it's it's good enough or that you make it past any kind of stop or moves. So definitely a, a, a whole different level to think about in finals that um, is different than qualifications where you can watch people and get beta from other people's movements. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so... I'm going to have to double check um, exactly what's happened because uh, it looks like we've now got Jakob Volvend climbing, um, which means perhaps the Teo was allowed to come back out, but I uh, maybe we will just have to double check on the scores on that one. Um, at the moment, we've got... Um, Kairi Bjork and Theo Halasvio uh, scored, tied on 3.1, and, and Daniel Kokoschka um, in third place with a 3.091. Um, and this is definitely Jakob Volven climbing right now uh, in bib number 14. <laughs> uh, so we'll just have to find out what's gone on with the scoring there. I think it will be because um, Theo was allowed to come back out and have another attempt after that hold broke on him. So Jakob has made short work of uh, the vertical section is already onto the steep section. One more move and he will also be at 3.1. <laughs> Can he go further? It really is a tricky hold, isn't it? That one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> have you got any inkling how that might be done? Well, the tricky thing is you'll want your the beak or kind of the very end of the pick to to be in that hold. It looks like it, you'll want it to be more directly in. It seems like because it's a little bit blind, people have been hooking it, but it doesn't seem to stay in that way. Um, so yes, here where it looks like the, the pick is actually in the hold, that looks a bit more yeah. secure. That seems to, to hold there. Um, Whereas if it's hooked, it, it doesn't seem to be what you want. Um, and then I think, yeah, moving into some kind of figure four. <laughs> oh, dear. It's always four, tricky nine, when you four, have both nine. your hands there. Oh, no. Oh. Uh, oh. Yeah. When you have both your hands on it, it can be especially disorienting to try and get your leg up because then you're going to have to move one of your hands but it makes it a little bit less stable. And, and once you start to kind of have your, your pick turn or spin, then it can be difficult to, to kind of stop that movement from happening. Um, oftentimes people will, if it's like a box or something like kick into the wall to help them stay put and, and his foot is there, um, but mm. moving your hands uh, makes it a little bit harder to, to stay as stable there, but obviously he had to hold himself on when he was moving away from the wall initially. So delicate move in yeah, general. So definitely delicate, but also really powerful at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And it looks like you're right that you have to really get the end of the pick into that hold uh, rather than hooking completely over it. Um, 
so exciting stuff in the men's but we're back to the women um and this is Vilja Helen from Finland um kicking off her attempt at becoming world champion in lead um currently she needs to beat Kasia Ogilvy who made it to clip 10 hold 23 and got a uh, 0.01 for moving away from that hold So her first target is Nessa McShannon, um, who made it to clip two, hold 10. Uh, that's what you can see on the right-hand side uh, on the leader bar. Um, each time she puts her pick onto a hold and makes positive movement, you'll see that number change. So it's just changed to hold number eight. Um, and so she's moving her way towards Nessa McShannon's fourth place. Yeah, as you were saying about the the points, I think it's it's also a whole strategy to think about where you are on the route and if you want different teammates or people in the crowd to be calling out time, because obviously they'll let you know when you're out of time, but sometimes it can be really helpful <laughs> as an athlete to think like, okay, well, I want my teammates to tell me when there's a minute left or two minutes left, because that may yeah. change kind of your pacing and your strategy. If you know you have a minute left, you're going to want to go kind of as fast as possible and, and maybe climb with like a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say like recklessness, but just just moving more quickly to try and get those last points, even if you don't know where other people have placed. And they may then change their strategy to like really go for a clip in that moment or to even like reach out and tap the next hold to try and get as many points as possible. So that's something that I think is also going through the athlete's head, uh, especially as they're getting a little bit higher to think about their points and how they can just like get as much as possible in those final moments. Wow, there's so much to think about. It's not just going up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I've just been told that it was Daniel that reclimbed. So apologies for getting that wrong. Um, Daniel was allowed to reclimb because of the hold. Um, I had forgotten which person <laughs> the hold broke on. <laughs> uh, this is a great shot looking down um, onto the women's route. And when Daniel fell before, I think we hadn't seen that that hold had popped off, but it seems like when he had turned around, he was probably calling the technical at that point, because interestingly with technicals, that's something you have to call right away. So if there is an issue with the route or like a clip is upside down or something, and you want to get that technical to have the opportunity to start again, you have to call it immediately. If you wait, then it may not be honored. And there are also times when maybe if a clip's upside down or something like that, and you have the opportunity to call a technical, but maybe you're high enough on the route and the thought of like climbing the route all over again is actually quite exhausting. And maybe you made it through a crux move that you're like, I don't know if I'm gonna have the energy to do it again. <laughs> and you would rather just be like, let me just fix this clip and move through it. People may not call the mm -hmm. technical in those moments because it, it's not, actually that advantageous. However, yes, yeah. if you rip a hold off and it causes you to fall, that's probably when you're gonna wanna call immediately to make sure that you do yeah. get that extra time. <laughs> and he was lower, so it made a lot of sense for him. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just to update everybody, um, this is Constantine Billy on the men's route. He's just starting off. Um, this is our now current world champion speed athlete in the under 19s. Um, so let's see if he can speed his way up the lead wall. Let's see if he can get past that crux move that so far has uh, challenged all of the other men. Vilja has also just climbed her way into third position for now. Um, just shaking out, obviously getting a little bit tired. You can see from that angle that it does actually overhang a little bit. Um, so they, they are getting tired on these routes, but it doesn't overhang quite as much as that men's route, does it? <laughs> no. Uh, getting to the 
the move that has stopped some other men. I'm curious to see how it goes for him. Me too. Come on, Constantine. Show us how it's done. question is, is it possible to do without cutting loose? So far, the answer is no. <laughs> I think he would probably be really stretched out. So I think that would be challenging. He did that very smoothly, yeah. though. Oh, you can see he's starting he to turn. It, but... So you saw him at that point reaching out with his hand. Is he allowed to use his hands at any point in the route mm -hmm. or only in certain places? Great question. So you can use your hands on any of the volumes. Um, so the parts of the wall that kind of jut out. Um, and you can also grab the holds that you put your pick on. You don't get the same amount of points if you just grab it with your hand. Like you have to put your pick on it to get that point. Um, However, you can use your hand to move through it. Um, and you'll see here, yeah, he's kind of balancing himself there. Oftentimes athletes in like a figure four position or something like that will either kick into the structure to help themselves stabilize or they'll use their hand there. And so that is totally legal, yes. Perfect, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. This looks like an absolutely enormous move that he's trying to do. And I'm not sure he's worked out how to do it yet. Um, in the meantime, look to the left. Um, Vilja is, was doing amazingly on the women's. I am absolutely cursing people this afternoon, aren't I, with my commentary. <laughs> as soon as I say they're doing well, they just fall off. <laughs> I do apologize, Vilja. Um, so Vilja Helen uh, does go into first place for now with a 9.25. Um, and sadly, we still haven't seen quite how the next move is done on the men's. Um, I'm not sure. I think he will get an extra um, bonus point because he did, ouch, move, uh, move away from the hold a bit. But we shall see if the judge gives him extra. On that men's route, they're obviously having to go somewhere um, towards that red striped volume. I can't imagine it's going to be a dyno because of the position that you're going from, but have you got any idea how they might be moving away from there? It looks like if you're in a figure four, I believe you should be able to kind of swing and reach that next kind of icicle structure uh, or volume, but it's a little hard to say how far that is. Um, I think it would be particularly hard to do a dyno where you're really releasing from that last hold you're on. Um, yeah. But I mean. with the, the way I've seen those picks turn, it definitely makes it difficult to swing and, and stay steady. You could see um, that he was continuing to kind of balance himself with his hand there so that he was facing the right direction. Um, and I should say too, I know you had asked about like using your hands and um, touching things on the route. If the route does have different red marked areas, like either on top of a hold, on, side of, on the side of a hold, um, you shouldn't be touching those. So curious how that may come into play. It looks like that was intentionally taped red. That might be an area mm. where you might not be able to use your hands. That is usually made clear to athletes in the technical or athlete meeting at the beginning. And you also can't be kind of grabbing the sides of the structure, like hooking your feet around the sides of the structure. That's another thing that um, is, is typically not allowed. So um, I'm curious how that might play into the, the moves beyond that point. Yeah, that's going to be really interesting because it does look like there's an awful lot of red tape or something on that next section, yeah. but, uh, but we're yet to get close enough to find out <laughs> what it is. Uh, so this is one of our uh, Spanish athletes, Jorge Viega Rodriguez. Um, Spain have sent quite a big team um, to Ulu this year. 
Um, so let's see how Jorge can do. He is one of the only ones who didn't compete this morning in speed. Um, so feeling fresh, hopefully. <laughs> um, he did come sixth last year in the World Youth Championships and third in the European Youth Championships. Um, but he did also compete as an adult last weekend in uh, Glasgow and came seventh. So hopefully we might see him cruise past the crux. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> The next athlete that we'll see um, in the women's will be Rosa Arnold from Finland, uh, but she still has a little while before she has to come out and tie in. Um, so we'll stick with the men and Jorge. It was very rapidly made it up to this point. Only using 15 seconds so far. Sorry, oh. one minute and 15 seconds of his time. <laughs> Maths was never my strong point at school. <laughs> <laughs> he is looking very confident on this. He also was very smooth in how he released his other tool. I was wondering about that when he kind of went into uh, the figure four, you could see that he still was kind of waiting that first tool. And so there is a bit more uh, strategy in how to release that without just completely giving yourself a big swing. So he did that very smoothly. And figure four right so onto far. that dagger. <laughs> yeah, this is textbook so far, isn't it? I mean, he's barely even taken a breath. It's so, so smooth uh, going into a figure nine. Um, <laughs> So this red tape, he's yeah, kicking all over it. That's, is that allowed? I am curious what they may have gone over at the athlete meeting um, because mm. it typically, yes, red means that you want to be avoiding it. And you can see he does appear to be very thoughtful about his footwork, but it also yeah. is it, it, there's a lot of red tape around the corners. And so I imagine that that is, you don't want to be like hooking around it. You don't want to be like grabbing your hand around the corner or edges of it to give yourself that advantage. But I mean, it, it also, I mean, I would think you'd want to be kicking into parts of it along the way as you're moving up. So I'm curious how they spoke about that to the athletes. Yeah, that would be great to know. We'll see if we can find out, um, He's still there. He has managed to get the next hold. Uh, we missed that while uh, Rosa was setting off um, for her campaign. It looks incredibly awkward, this sort of plywood see, icicle, let's call it. <laughs> <laughs> you can see he kicked in to the side, kind of in between the red, and it seems to be very careful in how mm. he's choosing to kick in. Looks, yes, very awkward. He's very bunched. I'm not 100% sure where he's going next. Ah, Rosa Arnold is coming down. It looks like she's going Im immediately for a start position again, though, so maybe there's a technical issue for Rosa Arnold. We'll. Um, we will wait and see. So I have had confirmation that on this particular um, structure, they are allowed to kick the red taped area. They just can't use it with their hands. Um, so Rosa Arnold confirmed sadly as falling um, at uh, clip one and hold eight and not being allowed to go back on. Uh, so her campaign is over, uh, currently sitting in last place. So we only have two women left. So um, our current third place, uh, first place athlete is guaranteed third place, which means Vilja Helen is guaranteed a podium position. 
It's really tricky because I know that in some of the World Cups, there were different judgment calls made about certain surfaces that athletes are not supposed to touch. And in some cases, um, athletes were penalized for touching certain surfaces. But in other cases, athletes, like if they touched it, but they didn't really like get a usable surface or didn't use it to their advantage to continue to move through, it was deemed okay. And I think that kind of varied by what was said in the athlete meeting, the different location, who was judging. And I, I think that is a really difficult position to be in as a judge to try and think about um, what's acceptable, what's not. But I know that that did end up making a few differences in the podium, especially I think around Champagny. Um, and so uh, I'm, yeah, I, I think it looks like it, it might be a, a difficult one to, to judge with that icicle. And so it, it makes sense that being able to kick into that area, it would be incredibly difficult to fully avoid that um, with your feet um, just because of the awkwardness. So having it mm. be really your hand that you can't use, that's a bit more clear, um, a bit easier to, to see from the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Easier to see from the ground. And he, I think it, it looks like it would be almost impossible to do without kicking the red tape um, because there's mm -hmm. so much of it for that particular section. Um, obviously, every section is, is different. Um, so Jorge Vieja Rodriguez uh, has guaranteed himself a place on the podium. He is currently sat in first place with 5.12 as a score um, with only two athletes to go. So... Um, thank you very much. Uh, there we go. We have uh, Viega Rodriguez in first, uh, Vili in second, and Volvent in third. Uh, but we do still have two more athletes to go in the men's and in the women's. So we will see what happens. Uh, these are our women's scores. So currently we have Helen in first place, Ogilvy in second place, and Kyla in third place. And Pulling onto the wall now is Tilda Quickenverter. <laughs> so can she beat Vilja Helen? Can she take home gold for Finland? So she's already overtaken the first athlete. The next one is Nessa McShannon on 2.1. So she should easily do that in the next few seconds. <laughs> and in the men's, the next athlete we see in the men's will be Tim Ziegler from Switzerland. But for now, we stick with Tilda Quickenverta. She seems very intentional with her feet. You can see that kind of more minimal kicks, like getting your pick in, kick, kick, moving up, getting your pick in, kick, kick. I know sometimes mm. it can be very tempting to want to adjust your feet a bunch to get them like to the right position or you put your tool in, you kind of move up and then you, you think about, oh, now I want to rearrange it to get this clip or to get to the next move. Um, and yeah. she seems to kind of effortlessly be using minimal kicking and, and thinking ahead there. So uh, it seems to be very efficient and save some time. That was the word that was coming to mind for me as well. Yeah, very efficient um, and very confident as well um, to be able mm -hmm. to do that. Someone I used to climb with um, used to challenge us always to move to a hold and then not move your hand or your foot um, until you are moving <laughs> to the next hold. So you're not allowed to rejig and it really encourages you to climb better. Um, and I assume it's the yeah. same with ice climbing. Um, if, if you do a good solid move the first time you move, then you're conserving energy and, and you know that you're gonna land that move properly um, rather than always allowing yeah. yourself that room for margin to move things around a bit. 
I agree. And I think the, the people that you'll see like really move up, um, into the top spots are the ones that are kind of thinking several moves ahead. And so it's not just mm -hmm. like, where's my next move? Like, where's the next hold? Where is the next clip? It's more like, how am I kind of dancing through these next few movements to be as efficient as possible? Yeah. That's a lovely way of putting it, dancing through the moves. I love that. <laughs> it was funny. I, I was uh, talking about route setting with a few other teammates recently, and uh, one of the people that was running the clinic who's competed for many years was talking about, you know, people don't know it, but they just, they love to dance. And, like, you know, the hip <laughs> movements, like a good route setter is, like, someone that helps them, like, really dance through this, and, like, they get to move their hips. And, like, yeah, so we were comparing it to dancing, and, thinking about, you know, what makes a route fun, what makes someone like really walk away from a route saying like that, that was so like flowy and graceful and beautiful. And, and it, it was hard to argue with as he was describing what makes a good route because um, like even here you can kind of see with the footwork, like it, it can almost emulate dancing in that way, as silly as that may be. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I love it. I think that's a, a great analogy. Um, and it was the perfect timing as well, because you really did see her have to kind of swing her hips slowly across and then weight that other foot. And yeah, it's delicate. It's powerful. It's It's got everything that dance has got as well. <laughs> <laughs> so just looking at the movement of the rope on the right hand side there, I think we are probably uh, getting tied in with Tim Ziegler as well on the men's route. Um, so no doubt we'll see him popping into shot sooner or later. There he is at the bottom, um, getting ready to start on men's final route. But we will stick with Tilda Quiconverter. Look at that, three fins on the leaderboard at the moment. Um, they are separated, I think, by a non-fin athlete, but let me just double check that for you. <laughs> Or we'll find out if she climbs past Rosa. Ronya, apologies. Ronya, Kyla, not Rosa. Wow, really, really standing her very furthest limit there, <laughs> uh, going up for that hold. It doesn't look like they've kicked very hard into the wall, but when they do a move like that, it really shows how far those picks are kicked into the wall because otherwise you just would not be able to stand up um, into that position uh, without your feet just falling away from you. <laughs> I always get nervous too when I see someone's foot really turn so that their their front coin is kind of at, at a sharper angle to the side. That always makes me nervous that it could pop. Um, but yeah, it, it seems that they've kicked in in a solid way to, to keep it in the wall there. So the finish, I thought that it was a full fin uh, podium, but at the moment, uh, the uh, podium is separated by a GB athlete, uh, Kasia Ogilvy. Um, who you can now see on the leader bar on the right hand side. Um, and then in the insect picture, we have got Tim Ziegler, who is making his way up to that crux, uh, first crux on the men's. We don't know yet if there's a second crux. <laughs> I'm sure there will be. As Tilda try and navigates this wobbly block um, with her left axe. It was a powerful move to get there too. I know we had seen a couple of people fall off. It looked like a floating undercling um, to get up to that volume, which always takes a lot of core tension there to be able to move through as smoothly as she did. Yeah. You could see her just turning around there as well, to, I assume, to check the time. Oh. Um, sadly, if she had just moved off, she might have made it a little bit further, but I think she burned some time and energy checking the time there. Oh, and Tim Ziegler is also down. Um, so 
So let's see if Tim's score has come in. So Tim made it to 4.1. So he's currently sat in second position. Um, so Jorge is still in first position, guaranteed second position. Tim is guaranteed third position. Here you see the moment, I think, of them both mm. falling. <laughs> Tim doesn't look too happy with that. Um, I assume he feels like he could have done better. Um, but it does look like an incredibly tough section. Um, only one more athlete to go in both the men's and the women's. So we will very shortly be able to crown our world champions in the under 19 category. Let's see if Rory Watson can make it past that crux. Show us what else is on the men's route. But don't forget, <laughs> all of the other athletes in the under-21s and the seniors will be climbing that as well. So we will, I'm sure, see what happens past <laughs> the uh, red icicle uh, later this afternoon. So our final athletes to come out will be Rory Watson in the men's um, and Lorena Beck from Liechtenstein in the women's. Um, just so that you know, Lorena Beck um, has qualified for the European Championships as well. Um, so her score from this will go into the um, scoreboard for the European Championships as well. A um, little bit complicated, but we will do our best to keep you up to date with that. <laughs> So we've obviously just got a slight delay. Oh, as soon as I said that, we get Lorena on the wall. Uh, so Lorena from Liechtenstein. Um, let's see what she can do. She is already a world champion. She uh, won this morning in the speed event. Can she be double world champion? That's quite a rare accolade. Only a few athletes have got that. <laughs> um, it would be amazing if she could be double world champion. <laughs> Looking very confident on that matched pull up there. Very smooth, yeah. This is the first of the really big moves, but she is making it look very easy. Getting her feet as high as she can without affecting that stein. I think it can be so tempting, especially like during finals or when you know you're you're ranked pretty high, to want to just start out the gate like really fast and like just blow through. You know, at the start, also a lot of times the holds are. A little more secure to help you kind of get up through the top rope section to start getting on lead and it seems like uh, she's been super intentional with thinking about moving at a consistent uh, controlled pace which is ultimately like slow as fast and that that's going to get you up a little bit higher and you can always start to kind of pick up the pace as you are getting confident and getting familiar with the route as well mm. yes smooth is fast is so true in so many sports <laughs> um, if, if it looks fast it often actually isn't um, <laughs> um, yeah. and she's obviously got an awful lot of experience she has been competing in the world cups this year um, as a senior athlete so although she's still only in the under 19s um, she has been competing in the seniors um, and has made 20th in Champagny and 23rd in Saspe. So she's done really, really well this season already. Um, and I think that experience is showing in her movements and, and how she's approaching this finals. Definitely.
And this is where uh, where the dancing came in a minute ago. So we'll see how she gets <laughs> past. <laughs> and she's been uh, competing we do with have... her sister as well, yes? Oh, yes, yeah, she has with Leah, Leah Beck. Beck. Mm -hmm. um, Always cool to it see looks one of the family like, affair. <laughs> definitely. Um, there were, there's a few families in this actually. Um, there's mm -hmm. a father and son competing um, this weekend, which I think is fantastic. Oh, wow. um, and, uh, and yeah, various brothers and sisters uh, and sisters. <laughs> so Rory Watson, I believe has just started. Yes, you can just see him behind the, um, whatever that tower is, um, just starting off his campaign. So he hopefully will get past that crux section. Um, we sort of moved the crux a little bit um, towards that red sort of pillar or icicle as I keep calling it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And Lorena is absolutely cruising up this so far. Making it look She's very up easy. one of the really big side moves, so we'll see how she gets on. Very smooth. Currently in fifth place. Ronya Kyla. Oh, she's just overtaken Ronya Kyler. So <laughs> she's now in fourth. And here we have Rory Watson from the UK. Getting his legs a little tangled in the rope, but immediately knowing to not hook that hold. So that's interesting. He read that straight away, um, just like Jorge did. And now we're back with Lorena again. Currently in fourth. Oh no. Rory has come off. That means we do have our world champion is from Spain, Jorge Rodriguez. Congratulations. You are a world champion. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic achievement for Jorge. We'll confirm all the results at the end of this, of course. Um, so now we will stick with uh, Lorena Beck, who is still hoping to go home a double world champion. It looks like she took that move differently. A bit more of a hook. It does. So I guess there are a few different ways you can use that one. It'll be interesting to see how the next category use all of the holds because of course they are on the same route, but they've got different levels of experience and possibly might be taller, might be stronger, but it depends because obviously I think in the women's, the athletes are actually a little bit older. Um, but in the men's, we do have those very young athletes. So it will be interesting to see how these routes get climbed over the course of the afternoon. Shaking out a bit. Moving the blood back into the arms. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear people shouting her on. So she's in silver medal position. Can she take the gold medal? Can she... She has, she's done it. Lorena Beck takes the gold medal. She is world champion. Well done, Lorena Beck. Double world champion here in Ulu, Finland. Absolutely incredible stuff. 34 seconds to get to the top. Can she do it? This is a, oh, it's not the top. Apologies. She could not make the top in the, in the time remaining, but she's going to go as far as she possibly can to get maximum points. Oh, wow. That was, I was wondering a very impressive. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so she knows that her score goes into the um, European 
championship as well. So although she's just taken gold in the World Youth Championships, that score will also go into the European Cup um, and she'll be hoping to get a good finish out of that. So that's why she was going for absolute maximum points um, and making that dino across. So we will shortly be moving on to um, the under 21s, but just to confirm those results, um, obviously these are provisional results, um, but to confirm where we're at so far, um, Lorena Beck did win. Um, Tilda Quickenverter takes the silver and uh, Vilja Helen takes the bronze. Sorry, that just needs updating a little bit. That's why that's wrong. Um, so the, in the men's, Jorge Vieja Rodriguez takes the gold medal. Tim Ziegler takes the silver medal. Constantine Willie takes the third bronze medal. And Rory Watson in fourth. Jakob Rolvend in fifth. Pyrie Bjork in sixth. And Tio Halasvio in seventh. With Daniel Kokoschka bringing up the rear in eighth. Absolutely brilliant stuff from the under-19 athletes. And it looks like we are straight on with the under-21 athletes. Um, so, sorry. Yes, the under-21 athletes. <laughs> Getting myself muddled up there. <laughs> um, so we are starting with Lauri Tupperainen from Finland on the men's route. So we are on to the new age category. We're now into the under 21s uh, for both the men and the women. Um, the amount of time they get doesn't change and the route doesn't change, um, but they are competing within their own age category. So a fresh set of athletes to get excited about. A slow start here from Lowry. A bit timid. Hmm. Wanting to make sure to, to be super secure on those holds. Yeah. So, as far as I'm aware, he hasn't actually competed in any other. Uh, lead events for the UIAA. Um, so this is his first major competition and he's already come third in the speed today. So having an absolutely brilliant start to his career. Um, That's incredible. He's one of the That's a huge milestone. <laughs> huge milestone. And he's also the second shortest in this category. Um, so we'll see if that plays a part um, in his climbing. He's the oldest but the second shortest. <laughs> so he has now got that Stein. But this is a huge move that he now has to do. So let's see how he gets on. It was impressive that he reached in first position. So you could see he, he hooked his tool into that stein while his hand was in the, the handle. So kind of the highest point there. And oftentimes people will move it closer to the pick to get it into the stein and then kind of move their hand up. Because when he's in that, that handle position, since his tool's upside down, he actually has to be even higher to, to hook it in. Mm. And so um, just hearing you say that he was the, the second shortest, I, I think that that was impressive being able to, to hook it in there like that because that was a pretty big reach for him. Yeah. Just to give you a bit more information on that, he, I mean, obviously 
he might have grown since he inputted his data, um, but uh, the data that he's inputted is he's 177 centimeters. Um, and our tallest athlete in this group is 192. So that's a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, probably has to move through some of these moves very differently. Yeah, absolutely. For some of those uh, higher moves. Yeah, particularly the move across onto the um, the red taped area. That's that's going to be quite mm. a big move for a smaller athlete. A lot of times on moves like this, too, things that certain athletes will do, like I've used this as well for a particularly big move, is like drop your pinky kind of below the bottom of the handle. And that actually gives you like a little bit more uh, height to be able to, to reach a bit further. Um, so don't know if he'll he'll do something like that, but um, something that every centimeter counts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'd forgotten that this one is also quite a reach, actually, because you're going round yeah. the back side of the volume. Especially if you can't see it as clearly, it can be hmm. a bit trickier. So just getting tied in now um, is our first of our under 21 female finalists, um, Johanna Turi. We actually only have three under 21 female finalists. So this is already an exciting podium performance, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> I was about to say we're sticking with Laurie, but we're not. We are uh, heading to Johanna Turi. The women's route starting off on these really tiny holds, um, some of which have to be matched. Need such precision and strength to get through even that first section on the women's. Oh, that's disappointing. That's it looks like it was difficult to stay in that that position for a while i imagine it takes a lot of energy to to stay there so i imagine he was getting a bit tired yeah yeah he was definitely struggling with that reach but it is not going to be impossible for a shorter athlete i'm sure we will see some of our shorter athletes do it um you just have to find the way So in the men's, um, once they've swapped over, we will have Bence Rigo Carminas from Hungary. But for now, we still have uh, Johanna Turi on the wall on the women's. I think it's always interesting She's to watch too how people are clipping. Um, I know that there are a couple different ways to clip and that can end up being a, a pretty big part of your pacing, your efficiency, especially with golf gloves, it's it's possible to get the, the glove caught up in the draw. Um, and knowing that that's something that can make such a big difference for points, that's something that mm. athletes will, will sometimes train for throughout the season too, just to make sure that their clipping isn't something that holds them back because you could be the strongest athlete out there. But if, if you're slow or inefficient at clipping or getting your glove caught in the draw, that can, that can really uh, put a damper on your performance as well. Definitely. That's a really good point. So they actually have to sort of dangle around at home and practice clipping uh, with their gloves on. <laughs> I mean, I think, it, yeah, some, some athletes will. Um, I, I know there are a couple different strategies and it can be interesting, especially thinking about youth who maybe have come into this sport through other um, climbing disciplines, other competitive, uh, like sport climbing or bouldering. Um, I think that Oftentimes, there are different ways that tend to be taught at the, the start of those mm. disciplines. And depending on where you are located as well, I think it can look different in Europe versus uh, North America. And uh, I know that for myself, I kind of learned one way that I don't think is the most efficient and used that for about a decade with sport climbing. And it was great because 
in sport climbing, oftentimes you're you're moving a little slower. You have time to think about where you want to go next, especially if you're not competing. And then realizing that, especially with draws that might be dangling out into space, like by some of those icicle holds, that's maybe not the, the way I want to be clipping if I'm trying to go as efficiently and quickly as possible. Um, and so I've been trying to practice more even while sport climbing or while climbing for dry tooling, um, having kind of uh, more ways to clip that I can pull mm. from as opposed to just one way that may not be ideal in certain circumstances. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, also, you already mentioned when you were talking about that, that they might get their gloves clipped in the drawer. The gloves are actually something you have to wear, aren't they? Yes, mm -hmm. you do have to have gloves. And there are different gloves that people tend to prefer, similar to tools. Um, I think some people will be more particular about like real leather versus fake leather and and look at different kind of grip um, on the uh, gloves available out there for dry tooling. Um, but uh, a lot of people would just kind of use uh, the typical like golf FJ uh, foot joy gloves. So uh, huh. can really vary. Yeah. So it's, it's more about grip than it is about being cold um <laughs> and about... yeah it's it's interesting i i think sometimes if you're just 100 percent ice climbing uh you might wear slightly thicker gloves for the warmth however there is a fine line between the thicker the glove often you have to uh it, it prevents you from being able to grip your tool as easily because you have kind of a, a wider grip or pinch if your glove is is thicker. And so you actually can pump out faster. Your your muscles in your hand will get sore much quicker. Um, and it does limit I... some of that dexterity. And so there is a fine line between, yes, the thin golf gloves are not going to keep you very warm. And there are not a lot of options out there that are are going to make a substantial difference in terms of warmth. So it's going to be more important that you have that dexterity um, and you aren't pumping out unnecessarily because of your gloves. That makes sense. As we just see, um, that was great timing. Vince fell just as you finished there. <laughs> um, and it looks like he might have got um, a couple of holes further than uh, Laurie did, uh, but we'll wait for that score to come in. Um, I should point out that the clock that was displayed um, while um, the female athlete, Johanna, it was on, was the clock for the men. So she does not have uh, four minutes remaining. Um, I'm not sure how long she's got at this point in time. Um, but it was the men's clock that was displayed. Um, just making good progress, slow and steady. Um, but like we've said before, slow can act, or not slow can be fast, but smooth can be fast. <laughs> um, and it can be deceptive, can't it? So Johanna Turi is on 10.24 at the moment. Still with time in hand. We'll see where she gets to. We don't have a confirmed high point for Bents yet, uh, but I'll let you know as soon as we do. But for now, let's see how Johanna gets through this quite tricky section with this block that's moving. How much does that affect you that the block is actually moving around like that? I mean, I know in South Korea, uh, the World Cup this season, there was kind of one main point that, had, that the blocks were attached to the ceiling. And a lot of athletes, especially with clips, like it started spinning and they had a lot of trouble being able to kind of stay in the direction they wanted to be and to be able to reach some of the clips. There were some people that would start to reach for a clip and then it would start turning and they had to kind of rearrange themselves, go from figure nine to figure four and go back and forth to 
maintain that energy and shake out their hands. And so it played a big role um, in mm. that world. And I think it can be interesting depending on how many points of connection the different volumes have to the wall because it will make a difference how much it will spin, but it definitely can um, be a, a, an extra added challenge to the route for the athlete. And you could see um, Johanna, just as we were talking there, she did actually deliberately uh, release her axe from the hold and jump off because she has timed out. So she's uh, timed out at 11.26. Um, so she will be guaranteed a third place because there are only three female athletes in this under 21 category. Um, next up will be Caitlin Russell Connor um, from the UK. Um, and over on the men's, um, we are still waiting for a confirmed score for Bents Rigo Carminas from Hungary. Um, but the next athlete up will be Henok Garcia Montoya. And just as I say that, the confirmed score has come in. So um, Bents timed out at 3.1. Um, so he currently sits in first place, but no doubt that will change. Um, so next up in the men's, Henok Garcia Montoya. And here he is. So if somebody wanted to get into ice climbing, um, what are the various routes that they could take to, to get into it, do you think? That's a great question. I think I have seen a few different ways that especially youth climbers I'm familiar with have gotten into it. And often I have seen that they have been involved in some other form of competitive climbing, whether it's sport climbing or bouldering. Um, they may also just climb outside, kind of doing trad climbing, maybe not as competitively, but I do think having that kind of ability to work under pressure does uh, play a key role in being able to move efficiently and quickly. As I was saying before with, with clipping, if someone is just sport climbing for fun, you may be used to just taking your time outside, kind of looking around the route. Um, but I think having access to like a training facility and or a team to train with can be really valuable. Um, I know in the US, dry tooling gyms are kind of few and far between. There are maybe three to four key areas that have some kind of training facility. Um, and so if you are not close to that area, it's very difficult to have access to the holds. Like as we talked about, the different holds can make a big difference in, in your advantage in the route. If you're familiar with where the pockets might be, um, or if you know how to hook your tool on it appropriately. So coming from kind of a different climbing uh, background, specifically around competitions, and then having access to some kind of training facility, whether that's outdoors or in a gym, um, and being able to practice with a team or with a coach, I think can make it a, a pretty big difference so that you're able to continue to grow and learn and develop and, and train with the right kinds of equipment um, to, to be able to come to competitions uh, ready to go and, and in a spot where you can be a competitive uh, candidate. Mm. And, and how much are you climbing outdoors uh, in a non-competitive environment? I think it depends on interest. I have one teammate who prefers outdoors and that is her predominant approach. Um, she's very close to crags where she's able to get out dry tooling and project different routes that are a bit more challenging. And I think that really helps her endurance and her headspace when it comes to leading um, and moving efficiently mm. through different, especially like figure four um, pumpy moves. And then like what we talked about, the downside of that is that you may not have the practice to be learning new holds that are coming out in different countries. You may not feel as comfortable doing movements like floating underclings that are not gonna be found in kind of natural environments as frequently. Uh, and so I think balancing it can be really ideal to get that headspace to get the endurance outside and do some longer routes 
um, but also being able to train on like a wooden structure in a dry tooling gym to be able to focus on some of those specific kind of uh, more man-made movements. Um, so I think a, a balance is ideal and it, it probably depends where you live, what you have access to at the end of the day, or if you have a team that you train with where you're meeting regularly at the gym, um, I mm. think then it forces you to kind of go in um, and keep kind of a disciplined routine. Cause at least in, in the U S a lot, uh, if not all of our athletes have full-time jobs, our students. And so I think keeping uh, yourself accountable with some kind of uh, team or regular training time or coach is, is critical because it's, it's a lot of work to put in that time to continue to get stronger and, and be prepared for these competitions, especially when you have a lot of other commitments going on in your life. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we're getting a really great display here from a headock about the different strengths that you need to have. You need to be incredibly flexible, um, have a lot of um, endurance and be really, really strong. So um, how much training is done off the wall as well as we just watch, uh, just uh, introduce Caitlin Russell Connor from the UK, who is our brand new uh, world champion speed athlete from this morning. Um, so, uh, yeah, the um, how much off wall training is going on for these athletes, do you think? I think there are also a lot of there's a lot of value in like weightlifting in core workouts in a lot of development of the muscles that you're going to use, but maybe not just only through using your tools. Um, as we've seen, a lot of these movements involve having a really good core tension to be able to move through some of those floating underclings, to be able to stay in figure fours, to be able, if like we saw on the men's route, pulling off, you're hanging on your tool, being able to like fold yourself up into a figure four from a complete hanging position. Like some of those things, if you're only climbing, you, you might be able to do that effectively, but it's gonna be incredibly helpful to also be training your core specifically, to be doing some like circuit workouts, to be able to weight lift so that you have um, some of that upper body strength as well. And I know with speed, um, there are certain workouts that the athletes that train specifically for speed will do um, that involve like leg workouts as well to really get that like power to, to go quickly mm -hmm. um, and move off your legs, which is not as critical or common sometimes if you are just focusing on the lead discipline. Um, so those are some of the different things that I've at least encountered with different teammates um, that play a big important yeah. role in our training. Yeah, and on the the move that he was displaying, he was almost doing the splits whilst upside down, which seems quite an impressive thing to be able to do. <laughs> um, so I'm guessing you're doing a lot of flexibility training as well. <laughs> That's true, we do. Um, have a, a teammate on the US team who does a lot of yoga. And I do think that that actually can come in handy a lot, um, both in terms of, I think, like thinking about like mindfulness and calming yourself down, especially like in terms of breathing when you're moving through a route, in terms of your nerves when you're in isolation, um, but also in terms of that flexibility. So there are other uh, ways that people may train uh, to, to really think about their headspace and their flexibility there too. Mm. It's really interesting that you say about headspace because earlier on you were saying how you don't really know what you're turning up to as an athlete. So how difficult is it? What can you do to, to maintain a, a healthy mindset? <laughs> That's a great question. I don't know that I have a, a perfect solution. Um, still something that I continue to, to chip away at each season. But I do think that I've seen people handle it differently in isolation. I think some people really want to uh, focus on a crux and like talk it through with other athletes. And so I've been in isolation where a lot of women are like, okay, here's what I'm thinking. And are you going to take it in reverse grip? And, you know, I think I'm going to skip that hold or I, you know, here's how I'm thinking about doing that crux move. And I've also seen other athletes where they're like, you know what, like, I saw the route preview. Here's what I'm thinking. I don't want to keep thinking about it the whole time I'm in isolation. That actually is just going to be a detriment to me that I'm going to get more anxious. I'm going to be second guessing myself. 
And so I think it depends on the way that different people want to process and prepare. Um, Cause I've mm. seen both be effective. And I think I, I even was looking at some different Instagram posts from athletes from Glasgow. And I know there was that big dyno move. And I think Marianne Vanderseen had even said like, you know, we went into isolation. We started talking about that dyno move and we did not stop. Like we kind of went <laughs> over it, over it. And like for them, like clearly Marianne made the dyno move and got first place. So it seems like that was an effective approach for her um, and maybe for other athletes that that isn't what they would have wanted to do. So I, I think um, there are a variety of ways that people will handle it. And I don't know that there's one that uh, trumps the others, but um, knowing what, what you need and what's going to stress you out. And if there is a point of, okay, now I've processed it too much and I need to stop, or I'm just going to start to second guess my strategy. Yeah, I think that's it. You've got to find what works for you and uh, build the environment around you uh, with this, with whatever you can control. Make sure you've got it in control and make sure you've got a plan for it. And that way you, you can hopefully maintain your mindset even when there are some unknowns um, that you're faced with. Yeah, and I think that's something that makes it so cool to watch different youth competitors that have been competing since they were at a younger age and maybe even in one of those categories where there's a three or four year age gap because they do get to have that experience to kind of think about okay you know maybe this didn't work for me this time so now the next time I'm going to try something different or maybe they get to kind of observe other people in isolation and how um, other athletes are processing it so that they get that extra experience to to be more confident about what they need and what works for them. I know sometimes if you start competing as an adult and that's not something you've had as much experience with or maybe you don't have as many competitions under your belt, that can be um, a little bit harder to figure out. Um, and maybe you're looking more to, to see what other people are doing versus knowing it for yourself. And I, I mm. think I speak for experience having started um, more recently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're... A, a latecomer to the climbing scene, aren't you? <laughs> yes. Or to the ice climbing scene, I should say. You've been climbing for a long time, but not ice climbing for so long. Yeah, in the competitive scene. It, yeah, it's been a, quite a learning experience. <laughs> but a really friendly environment and lots of support there. Yeah, I think that's something that I hear over and over again about the ice climbing dry tooling community is just that it has been much more positive, much more welcoming for a lot of people versus other uh, competitive sports. Mm, yeah. So if you're at home wondering whether you should get into it, then perhaps now is the time. <laughs> uh, we now have our uh, fourth male on the wall. This is Erno Robert Seregi from Hungary. And uh, he is the current, as of this morning, world champion speed athlete in the under 21 category. Um, so let's see how well he can do. Can he take uh, the double? Caitlin making it to this slightly awkward block, but making very light work of it. Um, moving straight away into this final section. Not sure how much time she's got left on the clock. So I don't know if she's got time to get to the top. I don't think she will, uh, but we will wait and see. Mm, does look like she timed out there. Yeah, it does. So we'll update you with her position as soon as we can. Let's have a little look. I think you're right. I think she chose to jump off. But did she get the hold? Ah! <laughs> I can't tell if she got that next hold or not. So we'll just have to wait for the score to come through on the uh, scoring system online. And while we come back to the men's and Erno Montoya looking incredibly confident 
already made his way onto this very tricky section. They have to swap, it seems, between a figure four and a figure nine. What, uh, what's the difference uh, in terms of what it does to the axe? Why do you swap between a four and a nine? Honestly, like right now, my impression is that he is swapping probably because he's getting pumped out, especially as he's swinging to try and get higher, putting a lot of pressure on that arm. And so wanting to shake out, kind of take a breath, reset. Um, and then come back to it. And I will also say too, you could see he was in, it looks like he's trying to switch his, his axis now. Yeah. He was in reverse grip too. Um, so had his arm kind of like backwards on the tool and being in reverse grip for a figure four takes even more kind of power and energy. That is one that is harder to hold for a longer period of time. And so I imagine that part of what he was trying to do here with switching was to see if he could get back into regular grip and, and be holding it kind of um, straight on. Uh, that That is something that tends to be a little bit easier to hold in the figure four for a bit longer. You can, that was some great shots there of how small the hold is that he's going for and how incredibly close he is to getting it. He's <laughs> so, so close. Oh. Yes. Oh, you feel like he should be. On it. You feel like he should be on it, <laughs> but he's just not quite. I'm yeah, see. and it, it's like a whole. Oh, sorry. Go for it. No, so I was just going to look at how tall he was. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering whether that's playing a factor, but I can't find him. Here he is. Uh, he's one seventy-eight, so he's he's second tallest of this group. You can see too when he does try and swing in that he really tries to put his knee right up by his wrist because that mm. can make a huge difference actually is like when you're in a figure four, especially as you get tired, it can be easy to have your knee kind of like slowly slope down your arm. And you yeah. like part of what you're doing with a figure four is you're kind of climbing your arm to get higher to get that extra reach. And so even having your knee go down like, you know, a, a few millimeters can make that difference and that extra reach. And you'll see he kind of like pendulums his body there to try and get that. And it's, it's even a, a different approach, whether you're able to kick into like what he was earlier, being able to kick into the volume to kind of mm. push off the volume and get higher versus just like um, kicking your leg down and trying to get reached that way. Um, it's, it's something that athletes will often practice both of those uh, approaches with figure fours because they can come into play, but they they look different. And especially as you mm. get tired, the technique is really important to hold to get that extra reach. Oh, oh yes! Got it. Oh, <laughs> absolutely incredible! I can't believe oh. after all that time oh, he actually he's got so tired. I'm sure. Ow! Looked like quite a nasty fall, but he looks like he is okay. A little bit days perhaps. Um, hopefully we'll cut away from that as quickly as possible. Thank you, team. So we now have Selena Bossard um, in the women's competition. Um, she is also one of our athletes who is looking to uh, get a score in the European Cup as well. So we will be looking very carefully at her score and taking it across into the European Cup. But for now, let's see if she can take home gold in the under 21 women's lead final of this World Youth Championships in Ulu. Already looking very casual, uh, making her way up through this sort of delicate first section before it gets a little bit more powerful. If she does want to make it into um, gold medal position. She needs to get to 11.28. Uh, but if she already wants to make moves in the European Cup, then she'll need to beat Lorena Beck, who is in 12.29, or has 12.29, apologies. Um, so we, we already know what she needs to do to not be at the bottom of the table, um, at least in the European Cup. So here we've got some replays of Erno Montoya Sereggi. Uh, and that oh. very nasty fall that he took. Um, but he did make 
at that uh, hold. Hopefully he made it before he timed out. I'm pretty sure he fell rather than timed out, but uh, we will have to double check on the scoring system. Oh, no, he did time out, but he did get the hold. So he got a 4.12. Um, so he is currently in gold medal position in the men's, which guarantees him at least a bronze medal uh, because there are only two more men to go in the under-21 men's final. And for now, we are looking at Selena Bossard, um, who is climbing her way, hoping to take home gold, but also hoping to put a really solid score on the board to put her in with a chance of taking home a medal in the European Cup as well. Um, she's been competing all season in the senior competitions, as well as doing the, this in the uh, World Youth Championships. She was second last year in World Youth, um, and in the seniors, she's managed a 12th and a 10th in Champagny and Sass Fay. So she is a really, really strong athlete and one to watch for the future. Just... I can't see. Did she has a, a backwards grip on that? I think she did. Um, I'm not I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very powerful movement, though, to be able to hook that mm. tiny little part of the hold and move through it. I always think it's so interesting, too, when you're on a volume like that, you can see that moving your hand up where hers is now, it sometimes can kind of get squashed against the volume there. So having to think about that as well as you move through. Yeah, that looks quite uncomfortable. And then to twist <laughs> out a bit as well. Uh, yeah, quite an unusual movement there. Doing a bit of the twist and shout to get up. <laughs> <laughs> and she's right uh, on the yeah, <laughs> on the men's route, um, we have, oh, we had, on the men's route, mm. we had uh, Javier Paredes Ramos, uh, but sadly, he has already fallen. Um, so we'll move back to uh, the women's with Selena Bossard, who is still going strong, already moving her way onto this top section, which we've not seen an awful lot of yet uh, so she has now gone into gold medal position and not only that but she has moved above Lorena Beck in the European Cup already um, so she already knows that she's not going to be last in the European Cup but where will she get to it's a very committing jump this <laughs> Getting lots of cheers of encouragement from below, and she does it. So, I don't see any tape along the top. Will she be allowed to put her feet over the top of that girder? Do you think? Or if it there's no tape, it it should be okay if they haven't been told otherwise in the technical meeting. <laughs> What an amazing move. Yeah, it can be very committing because oftentimes for things like dinos or if you're moving horizontally in a figure four, kind of figure nine position, it is best to kind of move past the clip before clipping it because otherwise you're kind of reaching out, the rope can be getting tangled in your tools or around your leg. Um, and so sometimes it, it requires only moving further than you might want to ideally, but it's it's the most efficient way to be able to make those clips. So to jump out to that dyno and, and know that if you miss it, you're going to take a big fall can be uh, pretty heady. It's pretty heady, but it was well worth it for Selena Bossard. She knew that if she made that jump, well, maybe she didn't, but she, <laughs> she hopefully knew that if she made that jump, she jumped herself into gold medal position and takes home the world championship title um, from this youth championships in Ulu. So there you have 
falling out of your screen, <laughs> the new world champion, Selena Bossard, um, and her score will go across to the uh, European Cup. She did top in seven minutes and 18 seconds. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see how quick any of the seniors managed to top um, or whether she goes home with more than one title today. So on to back to the men's. I'll confirm the rest of the women's scores in just a moment. But as we have somebody starting off, I'll let you know who that is. That is Milan Pellissier uh, from France. He competed this morning in the speed um, and came second. Um, so he has already got a silver medal um, to his name today. Uh, we'll see if he can take any more medals home. Absolutely cruising through that first section and quickly into the crux. Yeah, making it look very smooth and easy. These older athletes all seeming to know that they need to put the tip of the pick on that hold rather than hook it like a lot of the under 19s were trying to do. Um, so all of them actually managing to make that move. Oh, apart, oh no, not quite all of them, apologies. Um, but a lot of them <laughs> have made that move. You could see he kicked in right away to make sure he was stable and didn't have his pick turning like some of the other ones had, had yeah. experienced. And straight dynamically into a figure four, I think that was. Um, <laughs> that was very impressive. So can he make this rather large move that uh, Erno was struggling with? Milan is uh, 171 centimetres, uh, so he is one of the shorter athletes. Now, he's not actually allowed to do what he just did, um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. I don't feel like he gained anything from it, so hopefully he won't be penalised. But he did just grab that red tape, and that's what we were told earlier that they're not allowed to do. You can see he's trying to switch to get back into regular grip there. Mm. Have a little bit more of an advantage for that reach and being able to stay on a little longer. I can't tell on that hold if it's got a little um, sort of nubbin or if that's just a screw, which isn't all the way in. It almost looks like there's another bit where they can put yeah, yeah no, that's cool. part of the hold. Yeah, it's a pretty wild to look at, and uh, yeah. it looks like that was kind of the one of the higher holds on the women's route, almost just upside down, um, mm. because you aren't able to put your tool into like the screw holds or things like uh, those parts of the the hold. Um, those would be um, like a, a not very stable, but. <laughs> But yeah, um, we want to avoid the screws. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so Milan Pellissier has just, I don't really know what to call that, but he's just sort of koalaed into first place. <laughs> <laughs> he's really wrapped his legs around um, that volume and uh, is sitting there quite comfortably and has taken the gold medal in the World Youth Championships. Uh, not that he'll know it just yet, um, but what looked like a fairly comfortable position uh, is no longer as he tries to get out of it. Oh no. Well, that concludes the under 21 part of this competition. So, um, Milan Pellissier is your gold medalist. Um, Erno Montaya 
is in second place and Henok Garcia Montoya, sorry, Erno Montoya Sereggi is in second place and Henok Garcia Montoya is in third place. Um, in the women's, um, Selena Bossard topped and gets the gold. Uh, Caitlin Russell Connor takes silver and Johanna Turi takes the bronze. And we have already started with our senior athletes. Um, so, it is That's all like to play for. That. Let me just switch over to the senior competition. Um, and we will be with you shortly. So it's Aneta Lusheka, you are right. Um, we are rattling through this competition. So Aneta from the Czech Republic um, currently sits in fourth place in the overall. So we'll be looking very carefully to see where she finishes today, because not only will we be crowning the winner in Ulu for today's competition, but we will be crowning the overall European Cup winner as well. Um, so as you can see, uh, Lorena Beck is already on the board uh, with a 12.29. I'm pretty sure Selena Bossard should actually be at the top there um, with a top in 7.18. So uh, Lorena Beck is currently in second place and Aneta Lusheka is in third place. We'll get that updated for you shortly. Now, I'm going to risk it. I'm going to say that we're going to see a lot of tops in this women's final. That would be my hunch as well, based on what we saw from the youth. Yeah. So it might be it might be a race to the top like it was in the U16. <laughs> um, so keep your eyes peeled on the clock. <laughs> um, we will just have to wait and see. In the men's, let me just shoot over to the men's competition. Um, so we would be starting with Milan Palissier, but he has just climbed. Um, so we will actually be starting with uh, Jan Monzelowski. Uh, also, we won't be seeing Rory Watson again because he has also already climbed. I believe Jan is underway um, or is about to be underway. <laughs> He's gone green on the timing screen. But for now, we are with Aneta Lujeka from the Czech Republic. Aneta just struggling a little bit with that, uh, getting the stein in. Um, the stein is, a stein pull is where the, the tip of the axe and the back of the head are in opposing motion. So often you'll see it as a, an undercling like that and the back of the, the head of the axe is actually pressing against the wall and the tip of the axe is pulling away from the wall inside the hold almost. Um, so that's what she's aiming for, but she's not quite able to get it. And you can see when she first kind of went for it, her, her pick was at a little bit of an angle. So it was in there, but it wasn't able to like really dig into the wood the way you'd want. So mm. it makes it easier to slip. Um, and, and it looks like her tools have um, kind of these combs or kind of pointy uh, metal pieces uh, along the pick. And that can mm -hmm. really help with steins to like dig in even deeper, but it does have to be a little bit more uh, like perpendicular to the wood. Yeah. So you've got to be a bit more accurate, but, but if you can get it in there, it should stay in there a bit better because of those comey bits. Yeah. Uh, no, so. Bruised up that first part. <laughs> Cruising, cruising. Let's see what happens now. Uh, 
This is uh, Jan Modzelweski from Poland. Apologies for the pronunciation. Making that look easy. And I thought for a minute there he'd gone with the hook and that he was going to um, have a nasty fall. But luckily he <laughs> is on. Yeah, very smooth kicking in there to stabilize himself before removing his pick because you could see he had a bit of a release, so a bit of a swing. So having your foot in there helps to minimize that. Making that next move actually look quite simple as well. Yeah. Definitely using his core, being able to, to have his arms between those feet totally yeah. dangling and then be able to just pull himself right back in and oh, keep going. No. Oh, no. Oh, that is disappointing. He was looking incredibly strong. I'm quite glad that wasn't me that commentator cursed him that time. I, yeah. <laughs> I was feeling quite guilty. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he was looking really, really powerful, wasn't he? I was just thinking that his core was under so much tension. Um, but sadly, yeah. he just twisted off that little hold. Um, so... Jan, not going to shake up the podiums today, I don't think. But anything could happen. Uh, Anessa Lujeka is still on the wall, um, so we don't know where she's going to finish today. Oh, she was able to move through the Stein move. Excellent. currently in third place because we do have those two scores from our women earlier on in the day. Uh, one from the under 19s and one from the under 21s. It's an absolutely epic venue, isn't it? I, it must be a great view from the top. <laughs> I mean, we're yeah. getting a small, small sense of it, but wow. <laughs> Incredible. It does look cold watching some of the, all the belayers are, have multiple layers on. You can see people's breath and it makes me think about what people are, are thinking about with their warmups too, because a big part of that is you want to make sure that you don't get on the wall and just experience a, a flash pump right away as you're trying to go up or have your hands get incredibly cold and kind of not function the way you want. Um, mm. And so that definitely can come into play because it would be very disappointing to, to make it to finals to have trained for months and then you get out there and, and you get pumped right away or your hands are, are too cold to be able to make some of those moves that you know you're capable of. That's so true, yeah. Well, it looks like Aneta probably timed out. It looks like that was a deliberate jump down. Um, so we're just waiting for her score to be confirmed. Um, but it looks like she was around about 10.25. Um, so next up in the men's, we have David Buffard. Um, he is currently sat in fourth place in the championship. Um, so we'll be looking to get a really good score today and see if he can take the bronze medal in the overall um, and of course even better take home a medal today as well um, so that just confirms Jan's finished position and now we get underway with David Buffard you can see him kind of checking with the blares and making sure he's good to go so that he can pop right on and get going. Yeah. So if he just started, do they start the clock when he starts or do you have to wait for the exact second that you're allowed to start climbing? <laughs> no, great question. Um, you want to have both your tools on the first starting hold and then both your feet on the wall. And then as soon as you move your first axe or tool from that hold, that's when the clock starts. Right. Unless you do run just out have your designated. yeah, exactly designated time to be out there, tie in, and get ready to go. Perfect. <laughs> so yeah, really important that he's checking that he's there um, and the and that the judge is ready. Otherwise, you might have to come back down again and waste energy. Yeah. So I believe next up on the women's uh, will be Haruko Takuchi. So. 
Uh, Haruko is from Japan, uh, which means she gets to compete today. Um, however, she won't affect the scores in the overall European Cup. Um, so little extra added complication there, which is why we actually have nine athletes in the women's uh, class, because a non-European qualified for finals. Um, but David Buffard already up at the crux section or the first crux. We don't know if there's a second one yet. <laughs> um, we're yet to see. He knows what he's got to do. He's just got to find the best part of that hold. David says that his sporting heroes are David Lama and Conrad Anker. Um, so I wonder if once he stopped competing, he might turn his hand to uh, alpinism. Um, and maybe some strong sport climbing as well. He's making this look very easy. L looked like he was perhaps looking for the next hold there, a little bit confused. <laughs> How much of this is from memory? Um, so you, they've obviously seen the route, so they've been told what they are and aren't allowed to hold on to. How much are they memorizing? I think it's difficult to have enough time to, to really memorize every single move. You are allowed in route preview to bring out like a notebook and a pen. So you could hypothetically like draw the route out and like look over it more in isolation if if you want to i think again it goes to like do you want to really be analyzing it at that level is that beneficial yeah. for you um but oftentimes i think it's more focusing on like the crux moves or maybe moves that you're not a hundred percent certain about like is that hold you know a, a floating underclaim can i stein it or i i'm not familiar with that hold how do i want to take that and mm. then thinking about like, I would imagine for the men's route, focusing on this last sequence of moves that we've seen to be a crux for a lot of people, thinking about, okay, how do I wanna release out of that position? Do I wanna kick into the roof there, or the volume? Do I wanna be in a figure four, a figure nine? Do I wanna, like, if I'm gonna need that reach to be in a figure four for that move, if I wanna think maybe two moves before that, how can I set myself up for that? And so yeah. often, people will focus more on those kind of nuanced sequences. Um, but again, you, you could go out and draw the whole route on a notebook um, and uh, try and memorize the whole thing. I think sometimes I've also spoken with athletes who have said, you know, I've made this whole pl game plan of how I'm going to approach this and I'm, I'm going to do a figure four here and I'm going to switch to a nine here and I'm going to do that. And then sometimes you get there and the hold is maybe slightly different than you anticipate or maybe you get into a figure four but like for whatever reason you kind of forgot or you took the hold in a slightly different way so then you're in reverse grip and that impacts the whole rest of your sequence so i think some people are almost like i don't want to set up i don't want to try and memorize anything or, or tell myself i'm going to do this exact sequence because then i get there i'm out of sequence and then i'm i'm just like oh no this isn't what was supposed to happen so yeah I don't know a ton of people that fully memorize the entire route. I'm sure it, it has been done. Um, but I, I think I've heard more often that that has not actually been as advantageous as people want. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, so sadly, we did just lose David Boothfard from the competition. Uh, that puts him in a quite a dangerous position in terms of the overall because he is sat um, in fourth place at the moment with 151 points in the overall um, but without moving away from that and hopefully we will see some of the more senior athletes moving away from that hold so we will just have to wait and see how David finishes but it's going to be a tense wait for him um, but it doesn't look good for him taking a podium spot in the overall, I'm afraid. Um, so 
Next up, we should have uh, Haruko Takeuchi on the women's route. Um, and on the men's, we should have Andreas Gantner. So it looks like Haruki is just tying in. So it was really great to see some of the um, international athletes staying around um, for the European Cups as well. Um, I know some of the Americans took part in the Glasgow round, didn't they? Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's, a number of them even came back to the U.S. and then went back to Glasgow, which is, is uh, wow. quite a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> that's committed. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, it's obviously with a shortened season, it's a lot of hard work on the athletes and a lot of traveling, but it does um, give people the opportunity to stick around in Europe um, and do some of the European Cups as well. Um, although apparently you can make it home in between times. <laughs> yeah. But if yeah, you really I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think having the experience of more competitions is really a, a key way to, to grow and learn in this sport. It's, uh, you know, as, even if you have training facilities at home, I think being able to go and try different movements or different sequences that, that route setters have at these different competitions, to be able to see challenges that people run into, to be able to maybe experience new holds, it's, I think, so critical to progressing in the sport that the more competitions you can go to, uh, the better chance I think you have um, every season. Mm, yeah, it's a really yeah, really great point. Um, and talking of experience, uh, Haruki Takeuchi um, is an incredibly experienced athlete um, and has already taken a silver medal this year at Chong Song in the lead. Um, she's competed in lead and speed this season. Um, uh, but her second place in Chong Song has been her best result this year. Um, so hopefully we will see another top or at least um, getting very high on this route. Making very quick work of the lower section. Looks incredibly strong. Everything held in tension perfectly. Oh, there's that one that you're saying is on the men's route, but the other way up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think even higher up as well, um, the one that initially looked like a floater and then I've seen people hook it more. Um, mm. Seems like the, the same sort of hold in a couple different places. It'll be interesting actually to see um, how uh, Haruko gets on because uh, the Chongsong root setters are here uh, in Ulu. Um, so the Korean route set is setting here for the Youth World Championships and the European Cup. Um, so she got a second place um, in Chong Song. So perhaps their style suits her. Mm. If they were the same route set as that is. I don't know if they are. I will need to double check that. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like the sun might be coming out at last. Beautiful blue sky and sunshine now. <laughs> yeah. I think that can always make a, an interesting difference too, depending on what order you go in, what time of day it is. The temperature can swing um, sometimes pretty drastically, especially if, if anyone is ever climbing like first thing in the morning. I think it can be a pretty big difference um, in the temperature and, and that can definitely impact how they want to think about warming up or um, just, I think, mentally too, how awake you are. So, yeah. Different things that can come into play. Definitely. The sunshine that always wakes me up. <laughs> <laughs> so here's where I think there's another one of those holds that looks like up on the next volume. Um, the one that she's about to go to. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it would be good to get a close up of that find out what's going on with it. <laughs> and she's the second person I've seen take it a little bit more directly on, but you can see it does have that kind of screw looking piece that sticks out. And I think other people 
the majority of, of people that I've seen move through that have actually hooked it. Um, yeah. So yeah, but she, she looked like she'd actually put the point was... in to get a screw, didn't she? Yeah, it, it did look like she was able to float that to get a little bit higher. So far, making this route look incredibly easy, already um, taking third spot on the podium, um, but no doubt will get higher. Uh, if she wants to take second place currently, she would need to beat Lorena Beck, who is on 12.29. Um, so one more clip to go, three more holds to go, um, and she will beat Lorena Beck. And of course, if she wants to win, she has to top. <laughs> um, so Haruko can't actually um, affect the European Cup overall, but she can obviously affect today. Um, and she will be wanting to top. I think she's the first person I've seen take that hold with a figure four, which mm. is a really unique strategy either if you think the hold is maybe not such a great hold you don't want your pick to be wiggling any more than necessary or you want a little bit more reach or both um it can be a really effective way on a vertical wall to use the figure for this is a, a great angle to see just how far they have to jump that's the first time we've seen it from that angle and my goodness it's further than i thought it was <laughs> <laughs> so impressive um so if that clock is uh haruki's which i think it is she's got absolutely miles of time left on the clock um, so is easily going to top out in time uh, she's just got one more hold to go, although she is struggling to get this clip in. She's obviously not been dangling around at home like you suggested. <laughs> it's a long clip there and she's a little higher, so it, it seems a little bit awkward there. So this is really going to put the cast amongst the pigeons and it's going to make my maths even harder <laughs> as I'm trying to work out who takes the overall. But for now, uh, Haruki Takeuchi does almost, in just one more move, take a <laughs> gold medal position for now away from Selena Bossad. With over a minute so, left, that's really impressive. Very, very impressive uh, climb there from Haruki Takeuchi. Um, so I don't know if we've got a man on the wall at the moment. If we have, it'll be Andreas Gantner. But we don't know just yet. So well, very well done to Haruki Takeuchi, who is currently sat in first place in the European Cup. Um, she is from Japan, so there will also be somebody else who uh, sits in first place. So Lorena Beck, uh, apologies, Selena Bossard would currently also be in the gold medal position. It looks like Haruko finished in 621 and Selena was in 718. So, I mean, that's almost a minute difference. That's yeah, pretty massive. It's a, it's a huge difference. Um, and it, it'll be interesting to see if anyone can beat that time because that is really, really fast. Um, so my maths is about to get incredibly difficult trying to work out who takes the overall European Cup. <laughs> <laughs> because Selena Bossard isn't in the running for the podium as far as I know. Um, but maybe somebody can update me on that. <laughs> so as we wait for our other athletes, we're just getting some lovely shots of the full ice wall here in Ulu, Finland. Um, 
the sun absolutely blazing down on the forest um, and out to sea. <clears throat> and we have one, two, seven athletes left in the mail. Sorry if you could hear me counting there. <laughs> and uh, five athletes left in the female. Um, so the females will restart with Ema McSwigan from Ireland. Um, and we are still, it seems, waiting for Andreas Gantner. But here he is, Andreas Gantner from Liechtenstein, kicking off his attempt uh, on the men's route, which is causing people so much difficulty today. Will anyone get past that crucial point? So 5.12 um, is still the top to beat. That didn't quite make sense. Yeah, nobody's got to the top. The point to beat at the moment, I should say. <laughs> So I have just been updated. Selena um, is 14th in the overall. So she also can't really affect uh, what happens uh, to the podiums. Um, so although she is currently sat in first place in the Ulu European Cup, she can't affect the overall European Cup. Um, so maths is going to get tricky. <laughs> but we'll do our best. So Andreas Gantner cruising through this first section. Um, and I think we can now call the next part the crux. Um, this lower section was the crux um, for the under 19 athletes. But now that we're on to the more senior athletes, it really does look like um, getting past 5.12 is actually the crux. Oh, and it looks like he's just going to DTS this or dry tool style. Oh, there we go. He's switching into a uh, figure four. But uh, oftentimes uh, that can be another strategy is just kicking your feet up into the ceiling of or, or the volume above you as opposed to hooking your leg around your arm. Um, right. It often takes a bit more core strength to hold that. Um, mm -hmm. And as you can see, he, he did go into the figure four to get that uh actual reach to go a little bit further, but just one other strategy that people sometimes will use that can be harder or easier depending on the movement. Yeah. So another one that looks like he's made it, but just doesn't actually quite get the pick over the, the top of the little hold there. Switching to this view, which just shows the incredible blue sky today. <laughs> Um, so no doubt it will have warmed up a little bit. It was minus 10 this morning. Um, but I'm sure in the sunshine there, it can no longer be quite that cold. There we go. Right. Are we about to see someone go further? <laughs> Everybody at home, cheer on Andreas Gantner. Let's get further on this route. Can he beat the junior athlete, the youth athlete, Milan Policier? Looks like he either didn't like how it was placed or was having some trouble getting himself unhooked before. I'm not quite sure, but mm. did it seamlessly there. He's gone for that koala <laughs> technique as well. <laughs> yeah. So they obviously have been told that they're allowed to wrap their legs around this um, red tape section. It is only that they're not allowed to use their hands on the red tape section. Um, otherwise, this would be incredibly difficult. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it looks difficult enough as it is. <laughs> um, exactly. So just one more move and he will take the gold medal position. He's currently sat in silver medal position. Will he do it? Not sure what he was hoping to achieve with that slap against the volume there. Maybe he was just trying to 
stabilize himself a little bit. A very confident so. move. Wow. Absolutely brilliant. Come on. Oh, come on. Come on. You can tell he's getting tired now, but he has moved up into gold medal position. Uh, so now it's just how far can he get? How safe can he make himself? <laughs> the further he gets, the safer he is uh, with the remaining athletes still to come. So this is the first time we've seen this section of the route. So we've got no idea what he's trying to do now other than get to the top, of course. <laughs> Looks like the last two holds have been a little bit more of a jug, which is great. Maybe a, a little bit of a respite from that last awkward part. Um, but this yeah. one looks like it is perhaps a bit smaller. Definitely. <laughs> Still looking very confident on it though, isn't he? Mm-hmm. I just really want to see what happens with this barrel. <laughs> so I'm really hoping that someone makes it onto there. <laughs> uh, it's a, a good strategy to use your tool to be able to, to smack the, the next clip to get it to swing in your favor so it's easier to reach. Yeah, so I, they can smack it, but they can't obviously tug on it because then that would be aiding them to get further. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's come into play sometimes with the judging to kind of discern, did someone, as they were clipping, they kind of maybe pulled down on it. Did that give them an advantage or was that just, oh, he's off. Um, he's off. That was, was a, that absolutely that an attempt. Wow. That is a pumpy route there. <laughs> it really is. Uh, that was great stuff from Andreas Gantner. He is on an 8.17, so absolutely dominating the men's field at the moment. Uh, but we do still have seven athletes to come, so anything could happen. Um, but for now, Andreas Gantner safely in first place. So we should be heading back to the women's, I believe, um, and we will be looking for Ema McSwiggan. It looks like we are alternating men and women now rather than having them climb at the same time. So that's better for all of us. We can see everything that's going on, every move all the action from the wall here in Ulu, Finland. And I can see, I think, yes, Ema approaching the bottom of the wall now um, with her down jacket on. As you say, you've got to keep all of the layers on until the very last minute, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I definitely do, especially when it's cold out. Yeah. Yeah. And it's definitely cold. The sun might be out, but it is definitely still cold there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Golf gloves aren't going to keep your hands that warm. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> so she's tying on still in her down jacket. Um, I love those brightly colored axes. That's fantastic. <laughs> Are they, do you uh, wrap the axes in tape for grip? Yeah. Um, and a lot of times, too, people will rewrap them um, kind of prior to big competitions to make sure that it the tape hasn't kind of worn off or isn't starting to peel at the ends or anything like that. I know some people will put more kind of specific bite tape um, on the top part of it so that they can bite into it without it getting kind of torn up. And it, it's a little bit easier on your jaw, too. Um, and so that is definitely part of kind of a, a pre-competition uh, preparation that you might do with teammates or, or just to make sure that your gear is all ready to go. Um, and yeah, I think adding the fun colors can also help get you uh, motivated and, and excited for the, the climbing as well. Yeah, definitely. If you've got your favorite color on there or just 
one that makes you feel happy. That's definitely going to help, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And I know that uh, we talked a little bit about uh, different preferences for different kinds of tools. Sometimes people will modify their tools a little bit as well. Obviously, there are certain dimensions that for UIAA competitions, your tool has to kind of fit within a certain size uh, box. But hmm. beyond that, sometimes people will modify or kind of shave down different parts of their handles. Um, for example, one reason that you might do that is so that you can, if you have smaller hands especially, be able to see if you can fit two hands in that first handle, um, where's kind of the stock way that the, the tool is sold. Maybe you can only fit one hand in there. So if you shave it down a little bit, you can get a little bit of extra grip. It makes it a little easier to match, to switch hands um, across some of those movements. Uh, and uh, so people will also... Uh, maybe spend time doing that before they tape the tools. Wow. So these, most of these axes, you can just buy them from a regular climbing shop, uh, but then they get modified for competition. It's interesting. I think there are some different types that I, I think I see commonly in competitions and they do come from different distributors. They may be more or less easy to uh, to get. Um, like the Kukunogi ones are out of Russia. So um, uh, speaking from the American standpoint, that can sometimes be a little bit harder to get um, hmm. just for kind of political reasons um, with the relationship between the U.S. and Russia. And so those are often very favorable tools for a lot of people or even the picks or front points on your crampons um, coming out of Kukunogi, but maybe not the easiest to access depending on where you are. Um, mm. Or the South Korean tools, um, I know of teammates that have them, but typically they've gotten them like when they've traveled to South Korea. They're not as easily accessible um, from wow. just kind of uh, normal distribution uh, centers or brands. Um, you, you may have to have a contact with a certain area to know how to get them or to be able to um, make sure that they're made in the, the season that you want. That's incredible. So how would you actually know that you want to climb with them? Would you have tried somebody else's? Um, or? <laughs> yeah, no, great question. I think uh, that is often what people will do is see if there are teammates who have the kinds of tools or equipment that you'd want to use. Um, or sometimes people maybe just take a leap of faith in, and invest in them. I would say usually you try and, and do that. But I personally invested in Kalen boots. Um, hmm. They are out of Italy. So I did not actually have a way to try on my size before I ordered them. I just knew that the boots I had access to um, the Scarpa ones that a lot of teammates have and that I could try on um, didn't fit my foot very well. They had a really high arch and it, it was uncomfortable for me. A lot of people love them, but I think it's it's dependent on um, like your foot and your size. Um, and so I did kind of take a bit of a risk and I, I ordered <laughs> the Kalen boot out having tried my size on and they've worked out really well. Um, but that was definitely maybe not my best decision. Um, and it, it worked out. So I think it, it probably depends on uh, the athlete, how long they're competing, how much time it maybe takes to get certain uh, types of gear and when they have competitions coming up. Yeah. Just while we're on this uh, camera shot, it looks like she's got her crampons taped on her. Now, they, they obviously can't just be taped on, but <laughs> can you... Uh, Imagine why she might have tape around her foot like that. That is a great question. I do know, um, I'm not sure of Emer's situation, but I do know of teammates who sometimes maybe have like stripped bolts or something on the bottom of their, their boot, or maybe a certain piece broke and it could have happened maybe while they were traveling and they had spare parts, but it potentially a, it's a part of the boot that 
broke or is having issues that you would need to replace the whole boot to like really get at the root of the issue. And so I know I, I have one uh, other athlete that I'll climb with who even kind of joked about how he has like kind of a Franken boot at this point <laughs> um, and has kind of modified it because there is a piece that uh, broke and he, he, it, it still works to be able to kind of um, make band-aid solutions in the moment to kind of get through the season um, and then figures uh, that he'll he'll kind of reassess at the end of the season what makes sense. And so, of course, since this is the, the last competition of the season, um, it, it might be that there's something going on with her boot that is uh, modifiable in the moment and maybe uh, might warrant a longer term solution after Finland. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, I was forgetting that, of course, this is the last competition of the season. So, uh, yeah, gear might be <laughs> looking a little tired by now. <laughs> and also the athletes might be looking a little tired by now. They've been climbing uh, all year, pretty much every weekend um, this year. Uh, so they're probably ready for a break along with their equipment. <laughs> I think like burnout's definitely a topic that has come up when I've talked to other people in the U.S. about even team tryouts for next season is it, it demands a lot of athletes to think about that travel and especially if they have full-time jobs or they're in school or, wow, so smooth, Emer. did that. So I know. smooth. <laughs> but uh, I think like the idea of burnout is very real um, and thinking about what does it even look like to – set up tryouts for the team. I know different countries do that differently. Sometimes you have to try out every year. Sometimes you, you know, if you place in semifinals or finals at like a World Cup or a European Cup, um, you're guaranteed a spot on the team, whether it is in the top six place, because of course, six people can compete in each discipline from each team. It may look different, but knowing that you're probably going to be training for months leading up to this, you, you want to have some time off as well, probably over the summer so that you don't just end the season completely burnt out and not wanting to continue. Um, I think we've, we've seen that in some really strong athletes who have taken a few seasons off recently because they had competed for so many years and it, it's just a lot. It's really taxing. Mm, yeah, it is. It's particularly this season with the the back to back competitions that we had um from Korea and then Champagny and Saspe it's it is a lot um to ask of the body and the mind but the athletes are doing an incredible job um what we missed there was uh, Emma McSwigan uh, timing out sadly before she got to the top um but she did get to 14 point three one two uh, before she timed out so she currently sits in the second position <clears throat> uh, so we'll be going back to the men's now um, and we will have uh, Basil Fettet our current third place sitter in the overall um, so just a reminder that we're cheering everybody on for the gold medal today at Ulu, but we're also cheering everybody on for the overall European Cup title as well. So Basil Fetet um, currently sitting in third place in the championship with 185 points. Um, so he could take the overall title. He took, could take um, gold. But that relies on a lot of things happening. <laughs> so he would need to win. Um, Virgil Devin would need to finish lower than seventh place um, or seventh place or lower. Same with Dennis Van Hook. He would need to finish in sixth place or lower uh, and Basil would have to win. So lots and lots of things to look at um, as Basil sets off for his attempt at this route. Um, currently, he needs to get to 8.17. Apologies for the delay there. Uh, my brain wasn't quite functioning fast enough <laughs> after a day of commentary. <laughs> so Basil Fettet uh, cruising his way up this first section um, and looking to overtake Andreas Gantner, who got to 8.17. Seen a number of people uh, grab that volume to help 
get up a bit higher. It's looked very smooth. So um, mm. love it when I get to see like some kind of rock climbing moves. I know we saw a lot of that in the setting in Sasfe, um, where I think having some some bouldering moves uh, was helpful <laughs> to be able to move through some of the different sequences. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, I remember uh, Matt, the co-commentator on the uh, U16, was talking about SAS Faye really using these granite natural blocks quite a lot. Um, do you mm. find it good if there's a mixture of holds on the route, or do you prefer it if they're sort of all resin or all rock? Um, mm. That's a good point. I mean, I think it probably for athletes depends how comfortable they are on them. Like if you don't like the the rock holds and you go to Sosfe and there are more rock holds, you're probably not gonna be very happy. Um, mm. I think, uh, yeah, if I, I mean, it sounds lovely if there are a ton of the same hold that I know I'm confident on. I do think it's a good experience uh, if my my goal is to continue growing and learning. Um, to have a bit of a mixture and get some of that experience. Um, and we don't always have a ton of like rock holds in the US. So sometimes forcing myself to get on a route with a lot of rocks can can also help me grow in that way, even if it's not what I want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good point. <laughs> well, we just saw an incredibly exciting move there from Basil Fettet. I thought his uh, campaign might be over um, before it's even started, but he did manage to get it back under control um, and has moved on to this section. Hopefully he can get this quite tricky move done uh, and move into my favorite part where he is <laughs> grabbing on like a little koala <laughs> onto the icicle. <laughs> Um, but let's see, one move before that, he's got to get that small crimp with his left pick. Come on, Come on Basil. This is for the overall. If he can make it up to the same place as Andreas Gantner, he'll be putting himself into a really, really good position, a strong position uh, to perhaps uh, s stay on the overall podium. Uh, but who knows, there's still a lot of climbing yet to go. He's really going for the upside down technique. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure it's gonna work. Yeah, I think pros and cons to that in that he can kick his feet in and get a little bit of a rest there to be able to put some weight on his feet. Um, I think it also means that he then has to potentially kind of shift back into the figure four in and out of it, which can also take a little bit of energy there. Ooh. He is really struggling with this move. He's got himself really wrapped up in that rope as well. Back under control. He's just got to think about this. It might not be the fastest ascent, but if he can just make a few more moves, then he will put himself into current first place position. But he's really struggling with this and now having to do a one armor on that very tenuous hold. Come on, Basil. We know that you can do this. He's getting shouts from below. Come on, come on. <laughs> Taking a form of rest in the figure nine and then the figure four. He's not seeming to be able to get quite as high as the others. So everyone has struggled to get onto this hold. Quite a lot of them seem to be able to get the height, it's just not the accuracy, whereas Basil appears to be struggling to even get the height on this one. But I'm sure he can do it. He's still got 1 minute 45 on the clock, so plenty of time. Just needs to dig deep and get his pick over that crimp. It seems like he's, he's trying to decide kind of what hand he wants to go for, because you can see he gets that extra height. Is 
his hand he's figure fouring with is in second position or a bit higher on the tool that gets you up a bit higher. Um, but it seems like he's been shifting his hands back and forth and it seems like he's getting tired too, because when he's putting his, his leg over his arm, it seems like he's not like locking it off as hard here. He is a little bit more like you really want to like, like lock your knee around your wrist. Um, and keep it up high on your wrist. It looks like it's maybe slipping down a little bit on his arm, which makes a difference for that reach. Yeah, he was almost as, at his elbow, really, with the um, figure four there, wasn't he? Um, yeah, which is, is definitely challenging. And when you're getting tired, I mean, it's so much easier for me to say here as I'm watching it on the screen. I don't envy it. It's always easier as a commentator. <laughs> we can tell them what they're meant to do, but... Could we do it ourselves? Not so sure. <laughs> well, I know I couldn't. I'm sure you could. <laughs> uh, questionable. <laughs> but Basil knows that every point counts, so he is going to run the clock down on this move. Can he make it? He looks determined to do it as a one-armer, and he has just timed out. Um, so he finishes currently below... David Buffard. So a quick bit of maths would suggest that David Buffard still doesn't actually move up into third place. So Basil is still third place in the overall, um, but with plenty more athletes to come. He looks absolutely exhausted and I'm not surprised. <laughs> that looked really, really hard. I mean, and he was in that figure four, figure nine kind of uh, upside down position for over two minutes. I mean, talk about the endurance like required to even just hang there like that and swing yourself around going for that movement. I mean, that's that's pretty incredible. It really is. Um, I mean, the strength of all of the muscles around his shoulders, not to just sort of rip out at that point. He really almost twisted all the way around on one shoulder. It was its quite incredible. Um, he was very close to getting it too, with just dangling off of one arm, which yeah. <laughs> that is quite impressive. Not, not something you see a lot of people try. No, no. He, I was thinking the same. He actually looked like he was going to achieve it when he was just pulling up on one arm. Um, but sadly, not for Basil Fettet today. So we move on to the women and we have Mira Alahonsu from Finland. Just tying in. So she needs to get to the top in less than six minutes and 21 seconds if she wants to take the gold medal today. Um, she will not be able to affect the um, overall podium. Um, I should point out that Marianne van der Steen has actually won the women's overall. So we are playing for silver and bronze when I say about the podium. Um, so Marianne van der Steen has won on 280 points. Um, the only person that could have beat her overall would be Maya Habjan, but she um, was not able to compete in Ulu this weekend. So Marianne van der Steen is your overall European Cup winner. But there is still bronze and silver to sort out. And there is still a full podium for this weekend as well. <laughs> so lots still to go. That's incredible to be so far ahead like that, to have really solidified your position that you, you could even not start finals and to still be in first. That's, that's really impressive. It really is, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely incredible. And it, even though Maya could have beaten her, um, it would have basically um, relied on Marianne not starting. Um, <laughs> so there, it was a very big if, even if she had been here. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, Marianne has done an absolutely incredible effort this season. Um, but we are watching uh, Mira at the moment from Finland, uh, just making her way up through this sort of delicate section of the women's route. Looks like the sun is beginning to drop um, as we near the end of this competition. Still got four females, uh, including Mira. Um, so the podium's still wide open at this point. 
um, with some of our absolute best climbers still to come. We've still got Annie Bertling, uh, Marianne van der Steen and Olga Kosek still to come after Mira. So hopefully lots more tops, lots more of that dino action at the top. And in the men's, we do still have a lot of athletes still in the men's as well. So maybe I will get to see somebody go across that barrel. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I've asked really nicely. <laughs> People have been getting closer and closer, so I have high hopes. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so I think Mira is going for the steady approach. She looks just so smooth, very calm. Um, so I think she is going to fool everybody that she's actually climbing this very quickly. She's used up a minute of her time, so, uh, sorry, two minutes of her time. Um, and makes that look incredibly easy. Some of the other athletes have really struggled at that point, or at least had to work at it to get their feet up. But she just makes that look incredibly easy. Yeah, that was really smooth. I know one thing that uh, athletes will sometimes do in their training is like what we call tool repeaters. And they are a series of different movements that you know might be in a competition or might come up that you really want to be solid with. And so it could be like a big Stein movement like that. It could be like a floating undercling. It could be like a lock off. And you might choose some movements at a gym or whatever kind of facility you have, like a, a home wall and just repeat it over and over and over again so that it becomes something that you don't even really hesitate or think about. And so I, I would imagine that that's something she's practiced with how graceful that was. It was incredibly graceful, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, that's interesting. So repeats and moves, just doing the same thing over and over again. That's what you have to be, do if you wanna be the world's best. It may not sound the most exciting, but <laughs> yeah. you, know, you have to do things. Uh, she did actually yeah. win here in blue, uh, in the European Cup two years ago in 2021. Um, so she could well win again today. We'll just have to see how the time goes for her because uh, she does seem to be a little bit slower than some of our previous athletes. Haruki just did it so fast um, that she is going to be very hard to beat, I think. <laughs> Sorry, Haruko, not Haruki. She's very strong on these sideways movements, isn't she? Every time that she's having yeah. to go out one direction or another, she just seems really confident. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, less confident going straight up. <laughs> Then the figure four similar to Huruko. Yeah, that's interesting. It doesn't look steep enough to to warrant it, but obviously it is. It's hard to tell at home how steep the wall is. <laughs> and I think perhaps too, it could also indicate just how she's thinking about the hold and and trusting it to move up on it. Oftentimes. Mm -hmm. The other option would be to kind of lock off and pull yourself up. But the more you do that, kind of the higher you get and the more likely it is that you could pull your pick backwards and just even the slightest movement, especially at that kind of overhung angle, could pull it off. So using the figure four to keep your pick steady as you move up um, is a pretty good strategy for that. And it, it seemed like she also started to move up and then paused, made the clip, which was important in terms of points. But also, it, she moved through it so smoothly that it was curious. She, she didn't move through it and then clip off the next hold. So wonder if there was maybe a little bit of hesitation there. Yeah, and there was a good deal of hesitation just then as well, although not when she'd actually decided to go for the move. Um, but she did 
waste, for want of a better word, almost 30 seconds stood on top of that platform. She obviously needed it to recover her arms, but um, it does mean that she will not be going into gold medal position um, because she stood on that platform for quite a long time. It's all tactics at the end of the day. <laughs> So a brilliant top there from Mira. On my timing screen, it says that she has got the top and but timed out on the top. So we'll just wait and see if that gets updated um, to something else. Ah, she's left, <laughs> left her axe up there. That's gonna be a fun job for somebody to get that back. <laughs> she looks really, really happy with that result. And so she should be, that was a strong climb from Mira. It has been updated. She did the top in six minutes and 58 seconds. So that puts her in second position at the moment. So silver medal position for Mira at the moment. But we do still have three climbers to go in the women's. Uh, so it's still all to play for. Uh, next, we will be going back to the men. Um, and we will have Javier Cano Blazquez from Spain. Uh, but right now, let's enjoy this Brilliant jump from Mira. The camera angles there looking like she's jumping into a sunset, which is fantastic. <laughs> How will they get that back, do you think? <laughs> Typically, they do have some kind of like longer pole or hook of some sort. And knowing that there is, it looks like maybe a photographer or someone at the top. Um, I imagine that that is, is probably the, the easiest way to be able to grab it. Um, yeah. It looks like on the men's route, if, if they fell around that first crux move, they were almost handing them the pole to get their tool back, which, which seems a little bit unfortunate when they're probably not feeling quite excited about where they yeah. fell and then having to retrieve their own tool there. I'm probably feeling really pumped as well. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. not, not super fun. No, not ideal, but then it's in such an awkward place. Um, it is probably easiest to get the climber to do it. Um, so yeah. here we go. Javier Cano Blathquez from Spain, uh, ready to start his campaign on the men's final. In the men's, we do have five climbers still to go, including Javier. Um, so very much still all to play for. Um, and the athletes are, of course, coming out in reverse order. So technically, the best athlete comes out last, or at least the one who climbed the strongest yesterday comes out last. Um, and our final climber to come out will be Virgil Devin, who is currently leading the men's overall European Cup. Um, so very much still all to play for in the men's. Javier uh, did compete this year. He's uh, already competed in champagne en um and came 20th, uh, but that's the only competition he's done this year. Uh, last year, he took part in the World Championships and the European Championships. Uh, he gained 14th in the Europeans and 41st in the World Championships in Sasfe last year. Um, so he has got experience at this level, uh, but he has only been competing in the UIAA um, World Series since 2022. Um, so not as experienced as some of the other athletes um, in the competition, but making this look pretty easy so far. As we know, in the men's competition, it's all about this red section that's coming up. Um, the, the crux really does seem to be getting that small yellow crimp uh, on the upper section of this triangle volume. Come on. Come on. Looking very confident and strong, dangling on yeah. just one axe yeah, there. Um, <laughs> yeah, no problem, just pulling himself right back up into a figure four there. 
Super smooth release there. He does look, yeah, incredibly yeah. smooth and yeah. strong. <laughs> Core looks good. Yeah. But this is it. This is the moment. <laughs> Can he make the next hold? This is where an awful lot of the climbers have been getting unstuck this afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. And which option will he take? It doesn't look like that's going to work for him. He has actually got oh, no. that. <laughs> he's, got, he's got tape stuck on his face. <laughs> <laughs> Just to keep things interesting. So he's now swapping. I was about to say he's got his axe in mm -hmm. the opposite direction to most of the other climbers who've achieved the next hold, but he has now swapped that around. Um, so let's see if he can yeah. do it from there. But he has only got the very end of his axe on there. It looks a bit tenuous, but it has stopped rotating. So hopefully he can get this. I thought he was going to go for the one arm technique again there, <laughs> which, which Basil almost managed to achieve. But it looks like he's had second thoughts. Oh, my goodness. That was oh, wow. I, I a That's full 360. <laughs> yeah. Can't imagine that felt great on his arm, but recovered really quickly. This really is challenging all of the men today. This section. Very tenuous match there too. Yeah. Come on. Quite easy it to just knock one pick off with the other if you're not careful. Mm, absolutely. He seems to also be getting his foot almost um, toe hooking the bottom of that volume and I think it's actually not helping him um, get the height that he needs um, but I think he wants it to stop him rotating so I wonder if he can find a different way oh Ooh. no another athlete not making it past 4.11 so that is the end of Javier Cano Blackquest's day um, a brilliant effort, uh, but not going to make the podium today. It can be tricky with your, your hips more open. Oftentimes that can really influence how much you're, you're swinging. Um, in mm. a figure nine, kind of having your hips more open can be helpful to prevent that. Um, but when you're you're trying to pendulum yourself to get that extra reach in a figure four, you're going to want to kind of lock off your your knee a little bit more to to help minimize that. Could that be why he was spinning so much more than the others? Because as soon as he released that toe hook, he just seemed to go spinning around. Yeah, I think the toe hook did make it a little bit trickier because um, I think he was relying on that for a lot of his stability. And so when he was coming back down from having reached up, it seemed like his foot like kind of lost tension with, with the, the hook there and, and that, that kind of led to him spinning a bit. Mm. Yeah, it, it it was great because it was stopping him from spinning. But then as soon as he tried to move, it, it then made the spin far worse when it did come out. So um, definitely not the way to go, I would say. Um, <laughs> uh, so not that Dennis Van Hook needs to be told how to climb. And he is our next male athlete. Um, he's currently sat in second place in the overall cup. But of course, we will have a female athlete out next. Um, and we will be having any Bertling from Finland. So no doubt we will hear some very big cheers for any when she does appear. It does look like the sun is dropping and there were some lovely shots of the moon a minute ago um, from our camera team. Um, so we may be climbing into the dark um, or at least into much darker light. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
So any vertling just getting tied on um, currently in ninth, purely based on uh, qualification and the fact that she's not left the ground yet. Um, she doesn't need to go particularly far um, and will cruise through to probably fourth position quite easily. Hopefully I don't commentators curse her with that. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking at the uh, European Cup overalls, um, she's probably not in the running for a podium position um, in the overall, but she, of course, is in the running for a podium position today. Um, but we will keep you updated on the overalls. They have been um, thrown completely uh, into the wind with two athletes who aren't really in the European Cup uh, currently sitting uh, quite near the top uh, on the podium. So <laughs> we'll keep you updated as things progress. But here we go with any Bertling. Having a little bit of trouble kicking her um, fronts into the plywood at this stage. Do you find that around the world on the different structures, the plywood does behave differently? Somewhat. I think it's, I feel fortunate in the U.S. We, uh, where, where we train in Boulder, Colorado, have very hard plywood. And goodness, I, it, it is a real area of opportunity for me to kick into that. And so sometimes it's almost a benefit to train on that because then you get to these structures where the plywood is much softer and it's like a dream. I almost sometimes will get my front point stuck in it. Um, wow. <laughs> but that being said, I think, yeah, depending on how, like where you're training, I do think there can be a difference um, across the different structures and that that can really impact how you kick into the plywood. I know um, similar to taping your tools, modifying your tools, a lot of people will be really strategic about how they sharpen their front points or their even the picks on their tools or they may have different front points, different picks that they swap in depending on the structure, depending on how much, much ice there is. Um, you might uh, modify or, or shave your uh, tool picks based on what kind of holds you can expect, whether they're going to be more rock holds, more resin holds. Do you want your pick to be sharper and kind of bite into some of the holds versus maybe a little bit more dull if you're going to be hooking them more or differently. Um, so yeah, I think there's also a ton of strategy in that, that I'm still admittedly learning a lot about, um, but something that definitely factors into people's decisions as they're preparing. Mm. It, with the um, crampons, we, we saw already in the um, U16 that some of the athletes had a different setup. How much scope is there for choosing what you do or don't do with your uh, fruit boots and crampons? Yeah, I think um, the rakes, which are kind of the, the side uh, sharp points of your crampon rather than just the front point, like you'll see on Ennie's crampons that there are several points that mm -hmm. also face down. Um, yeah. Oftentimes, I think part of the decision making process can be, do I want to be wearing crampons that like have rakes or do I want kind of more just to focus on the front point itself? And oftentimes the things that might play into that are how much ice is there going to be and how many volumes are there? How am I going to be going across these different volumes? Because the rakes can be really helpful to give you extra stability in the ice. If you just have like one front point that can be a little bit sketchier. Um, and in the volumes, depending on the angle you're moving through them, it can help to kind of almost hook with the rakes and give you a bit more stability as you move through those as well. Um, so those are some of the things that I think people consider as they're deciding mm. what crampons to use. So is that a decision that they can make on the day or is it something that they have to decide on earlier? I think a lot of people will bring a variety of crampons and they can decide on the day. I know some people that also compete in speed, depending on the schedule of the competition, they may even have to be swapping their crampons out like that morning if they're in speed and then they're in lead later because um, you use different crampons for, for speed climbing. And so um, 
you you do want to come usually prepared with like extra tools, extra screws, things like that in case something goes wrong. Um, and so that you can modify as you learn more about the route or the route setting or um, just think about the conditions and what you're comfortable with. Wow. It's, yeah, it's so interesting to learn uh, as somebody who doesn't ice climb. It's really interesting to hear that, yeah, you're making multiple decisions. You're not just training to climb, but you're also learning about the equipment, learning all of the different types of equipment and what you can and can't do to that. Because obviously there are rules within the UIAA as to where you're allowed to put mm-hmm. crampons. I know that I read that you're not allowed to have them on the top of your foot at all um, mm-hmm. to aid hooks or anything like that um and then yeah on the day you're not only having to concentrate on your competitive performance um from a physical perspective but you and from a mental perspective but you're also then having to choose which equipment you're using and whether you have to change that around um there's a lot going on yeah definitely and i know in in south korea um there was a little bit of shifting and kind of reassessing as far as the speed climbing, I think they had a protest and they were trying to decide what made sense for how to move forward, if they were gonna redo some of the speed routes. And so I know that for teammates that were in the speed competition and also finals for lead, that ended up like really impacting some of their their headspace because they were going back and forth about, okay, am I gonna go in and redo my speed run now? Am I gonna, isolation has opened for lead already? Am I supposed to be there? you know, it's a different headspace to be in if you're thinking Mm -hmm. about speed climbing versus lead and like the equipment needed for it, especially in terms of crampons, like, you know, is all of the stuff you need in isolation? Did you get a chance to eat lunch? And so things like that, that maybe seem kind of basic that can really play into, you know, how confident someone feels or how ready they feel to compete. So um, other little fun factors that can come into play at different competitions. Yeah, absolutely incredible. And what something else that's incredible is Annie Bertling, um, who is about <laughs> to top the route. Um, not sure how quickly she's done it. We'll have to wait um, and find out what her time was. Uh, we'll just wait for the online system to update. But an incredible performance, as expected, from Annie Bertling. Wow, her time has just come in as a 6.18. So she does go into first place, uh, gold medal position for any Bertling. Wow, that's incredibly fast. Yeah, absolutely. I really didn't think we were going to see anyone beat Haruko. <laughs> um, so, yeah, wow. Well done, any Bertling, currently in gold medal position, pushes Haruko down to silver medal position. Um, and Mira in bronze medal position currently, but we do still have two athletes to go, and they are two incredibly strong athletes. We've got Marianne van der Steen, the current leader, in fact, the overall winner of the European Cup, and Olga Kosek, who is the current um, third place uh, athlete in the overall. Just to complicate things, she is more than likely to actually be the silver place medalist um, in the overall because uh, Maya's not here. But we are jumping back across to the men um, where we should have Dennis van Hook, the current second place athlete from the Netherlands. And there he is. So Dennis, what can you do? Can you beat Virgil? Um, if he wants to take the overall, then if he wins, uh, Virgil, uh, he would beat Virgil if he wins. Virgil could not beat him. But after that, it gets far more complicated. So we'll wait and find out where he gets to and then update you uh, rather than me giving you a million choices for what could happen (laughs) over the course of this competition. Let's just enjoy him climbing for the time being.
He's making this lower section look incredibly easy. He is one of the taller athletes, mm -hmm. so hopefully this move won't cause him any trouble. He's actually looking to clip from there. So here we go, an easy reach for Dennis Van Hook, but not able to quite get the pick in the right place. He's just testing it out before he fully weights it and it looks like he's happy. And this is not something we've seen much of. He's actually going to try and match that hold. Most of the other athletes have just taken it with one axe, uh, but he is going for the match. You can see how cold it's now getting. So um, you were mentioning that uh, the conditions change and that might affect the climbers. And it definitely looks like it's getting very, very cold. Now the sun's going down. Yeah. Very smooth with his clipping so far too. You could see that he used that strategy to, to hit the clip with his tool to get it to swing over to him. But then also, even with the tool in his mouth, pulling down on the rope to just effortlessly clip it in, I think that can sometimes be a challenge when you maybe have bitten the rope to get a little bit of extra slack, being able to find other ways to just pull it out quickly and keep moving. Mm. Oh, wow. Seamlessly just getting wow. to the next one. That was really smooth. Blink a lot. and you miss uh, <laughs> That's <laughs> exactly, yeah, saving a lot of energy for the next few moves, which is important. Yeah. He did get very tangled in his rope, but that does not matter. He's even got his name on his harness. He really is one of the world's best. <laughs> so Dennis Van Hook looking to take the overall title as well as the gold medal today. Um, he does need to finish above Virgil Devin if he wants to take the overall. Let's leave it at that for now to avoid complicated sentences. <laughs> Just not quite getting into the right position just yet for this next move. not enjoying uh, the little koala curl as much as other people. He's really slipping off the bottom of that volume. Yeah, and this is where actually being taller might be a bit more awkward because um, it it's a little bit more scrunched up. And so it seems like to get that reach, he maybe has to be a little bit more creative here. Yeah, that's a good point. He just seemed to really, almost as soon as he got his legs wrapped around, they were just sliding. So maybe he needs some less slidey yeah. trousers. Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure his thighs are probably strong enough. Um, <laughs> so let's blame the trousers for now. <laughs> I'm curious if he was even contemplating skipping too, kind of the direction he was looking. Okay, he looks a little more solid there. He does. He, I don't want to cause a ruckus, but it, he did, I think, touch the red tape just then with his hand. So we just have to see how this goes for um, Dennis as time goes on. But he didn't actually grab anything, so hopefully that actually counts and is all okay. easily making it out to that nice jug. Um, and then the next one from memory is not such a good hold, um, a little bit tenuous. But making it with ease, really kicking hard now. Looking Are we a bit going more to comfortable now that he's going to pass that. <laughs> Please go onto the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. 
you can hear people shouting down below, come on, come on. It's not just me that wants to see these climbers get higher. Everybody <laughs> in the, not. Yeah, everyone at home, everyone in the venue, both of us, we really want everyone to succeed. Come on, Dennis. So, by my reckoning, he has now equaled uh, Andreas Gantner. Yes, he has. So he's moved into gold medal position. Currently, he would also take the overall, uh, but obviously we do still have four climbers to go after this. So anything could happen. Wow, big lot of snow coming down, yeah. along with Dennis Van Hook. <laughs> Glad we had that one. <laughs> I'm not sure what that was that he's just shouted, but he seemed pretty surprised to have fallen there and a bit disappointed. Um, but hopefully he's pleased with the performance because he is in gold medal position for the time being, uh, which does mean he is also in gold medal position for the overall in the men's. So we jump back once again to the women's uh, and we have our overall winner, Marianne van der Steen, coming up next. Can she do as well as her Dutch counterpart and uh, take the gold medal today as well as the gold overall? Do you think it's hard to carry on pushing when you've already won the overall? Ooh, I mean, I think Marianne has trained so hard for this season. And I think it was from what I had seen through her posts and such, it seemed like it was a really motivating, exciting thing to be in first. So I think that my gut says that that almost like energized her more um, to keep going and to see like kind of the fruits of her labor from the last several months. I know that it can be like a lot of, of taxing training and, and mental games about, you know, your expectations for yourself, other people's expectations for you. Have you done enough? What is the next competition going to be like? So I could see how sometimes, yes, it would probably be hard to stay motivated, but I think based on, just how hard she's worked and, and how thrilling that was to do well. I, I would imagine that it was propel her to, to keep pushing even harder. Yeah. I imagine also with it being the final round and knowing that you're going to get crowned overall uh, cup winner, you also want to take the gold medal as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and to know that you, yeah, you kept on pushing and, and did well all the way through. Um, yeah, and maybe it's extra motivating. <laughs> so Marianne sets off and of course makes it all look very, very easy. So the question really isn't, is she going to top? The question is, how quickly is she going to top? Uh, that's at least how I feel about this. Um, good thing she can't hear me. It's adding, adding the pressure. <laughs> so fantastic images there. It's a little bit um, misleading. The, the wall isn't actually <laughs> uh, going away from the climber. The, the wall is slightly overhanging. Um, the perspective is a little bit um, off on that camera angle. So Marianne really having to work hard all the way from the bottom of this wall. But this is her victory dance. You can see her using her hand there on the hold. That that's a, an effective way to get higher too. That's fine as long as it's part of the the route there. Perfect. So yeah, she wouldn't be allowed to use anything else, but as long as it's part of the route, um, she can use her hands for whatever she wants. That is unless she uh, there. 
is red tape. So on the men's route, you can see there's lots of red tape. They're not allowed to use their hands on that section. Uh, but on the women's route, we've not seen any of that. There is no red tape anywhere. Um, so it looks like they are allowed to use every single hold with their hands if they want to. So really making very smooth work of this lower section. Um, I say lower section, the women's route almost isn't in sections. It's just straight up this wall, this slightly overhanging wall, and then onto the impressive jump at the end. And so far, everyone that has attempted that has made it and topped out. So it really is all over once you make the jump onto the hold next to clip 14. So Marianne She's Van Steen. <laughs> she is incredibly smooth, isn't she? Yeah, really, really yeah, good. Very intentional. Each footwork, little shakes here and there to like make sure that she's not pumping out. And hardly using any time at all. Um, really, really smooth and speedy climbing from Mar Marianne Van Der Steen. She is our penultimate athlete in the women's. But there are slightly uh, more men uh, left. So I think we have three men left, but uh, Marianne is our penultimate female. And certainly looks like she will be able to do the full victory lap on this route. Super smooth. That lock off didn't go into figure four, but just cruised right through that. Really impressive. Yeah, an incredibly strong climber. Um, and obviously very good technically as well. But those kicks, I mean, you can almost see the, the crampon disappear into the wall that she's kicking so hard. Very decisive. Yeah, from the hip. So I think it, it makes it much more straight on, much more powerful. She's been competing for a while too. And I think she's someone that uh, when you're competing alongside her, she is someone that has great suggestions and feedback, um, like really supportive to other female athletes. So um, really cool to see. I know she was, uh, I was commenting on, oh my goodness, you, you just cruised up that route at Sosfe, you were so quick. And she was like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't always quick. It's taken a while to get to where I am now. And I've really like trained hard to be thoughtful about that. That's so great to hear. Uh, really, really nice. Well, here we go. This is it for Marianne Van Der Steen. This is her victory lap. She has oh. won the overall European Cup and quite possibly has also won the uh, gold medal in Ulu as well, but we will wait to find that out. There is still one more athlete and her time has not been confirmed just yet, but I'm pretty sure that was a very, very fast time. Yeah, over two minutes left. Wow, it's looking like 5.30. Wow, wow. 5.30 for Marianne van der Steen. That is incredible. incredible. <laughs> wow. Seems like maybe it was extra motivation for her to really push through that yeah. and aim for first place. Yeah. Didn't rest she on didn't actually look all that happy when she was tying just then, but I don't really know why, because she has just taken the overall gold and is highly likely to also take the gold here in Ulu. Uh, but with one more athlete to go, she may um, be in silver medal position. We will just wait to find out if older Cossack can go faster. But that is an incredible time to beat, isn't it? 5.30. What a performance. Wow, yeah. Absolutely fantastic. So we should now hopefully be going back to the men. We've got three men left. Um, we've got Pauli Salmonen, Kevin Lindlau and Virgil Devin. Um, 
So Virgil will be looking to beat Dennis Van Hook. Dennis got to 8.17. So if Virgil can beat Dennis, then he will take the overall. If he doesn't beat Dennis, uh, then depending on where he gets to, we will have to let you know what happens. But Dennis will likely win if, uh, if Virgil doesn't beat him. <laughs> so we start off with Pauli Salmonen, who cannot rock this podium. <laughs> but he could, of course, podium here in Ulu because there are two lots of medals to give away on this final. <laughs> Almost setting off with the wrong lot of gloves. <laughs> that really would have caused some issues, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, that would have been frustrating for him. I did notice on um, Caitlin's attempt, she actually looked like she was having some issues with one of her uh, her left boot. Um, so it'd be interesting mm -hmm. to find out from her um, what happened there. But it didn't affect her too badly. She still had a really good um, attempt at the route. I think that that is a, an athlete's, uh, I don't want to say worst fear, but that's definitely something you don't want is to get up there and have issues with either crampon or, or some piece of gear that is pretty critical to your ability to do the route. Yeah, definitely. And she was stood on top of a volume um, and I think she had a stein on her right hand and then yeah, was stood up with her um, boot on a volume and she was just playing with something. Um, she obviously wasn't happy. Uh, so that must have used up quite a lot of her energy. Um, I would imagine so. But luckily, Paulie Salmonen did notice that he'd got the wrong gloves on uh, just before he set off. So uh, no troubles for him as he really starts to get involved with this route. I know in North American, uh, the Continental Cup last year in Ure, it was so cold and there was ice at the beginning part of the route that some athletes even started with different gloves. And I think oh, this wow. is probably different everywhere. But in Ure, they said, you know, if you drop anything, you will be disqualified. And so athletes were strategizing wearing larger gloves through the ice part and then taking them off and stuffing them down their shirt with the hope that the harness would keep it in. Um, so haven't seen that at any World Cups or even when it's so cold in Finland, but I know that's something that people were um, getting creative with before. Yeah, that's such a big risk to take as well. Yeah. <laughs> so another athlete there stabilizing themselves and touching that red tape. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens after this, because um, I think he's the third or fourth athlete that's actually done that. Um, they might just have to say, fine, <laughs> you're allowed to stabilize. <laughs> I suppose if they're not pulling up on it, maybe the, maybe that's where that rule comes into play. We shall wait and find out. Now, Paulie Salmonen is making this look like child's play. Oh, very, very almost slipped just as I said that. But he really is making this look incredibly easy. Everybody else has struggled quite a lot to even get onto that yellow crimp. And he's just cruised wow. through that whole section. Yeah, footwork. He avoided the koala move and, and kicked right into the, the volume. And it seemed to be more effective for him at least. Hmm, definitely. And was able just to, I think he got it, the crimp on his first go, um, which is incredible. So he yeah, has three minutes. Precise. <laughs> yeah, super precise and very quick. So maybe, maybe this is the athlete that is going to take us all the way along that barrel. Once he has 
finished his climb, we should know our first podium finisher for today's competition. We won't necessarily know our podium finishers for the overall, um, but yeah, we will know our first podium finisher for today once he's finished. This is great footage from the drone taking us round, so you can really see the athlete and the hold from every angle. And, it's, and it is actually getting really quite dark now. In I was going to say, it's definitely shifted, huh? <laughs> yeah. So I wonder how the shadowing will play a part, because obviously the first athletes wouldn't have... Oh! No. That came as a surprise. <laughs> but he seems very happy with it anyway, giving the crowd a massive salute. Uh, it looks like he did lose an axe. I didn't see if it fell down or if it's still up there. Um, but big smiles from Pauli Salmanen. Um, so we'll just wait for his score to come in before I confirm where he got to. Um, but certainly not shaking up the podium today. So once he has untied, we will have our final female athlete. Um, so Olga Kosek is our next climber to come out. Um, but just as we see some of uh, Pauli Salmanen's highlights here. Almost disappearing against the bright blue sky. Absolutely beautiful in Ulu today. And this is where he has his first slip really doesn't want to get into the koala. <laughs> oh, he does leave his axe up there. He just twists off his other axe. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was a salute to the crowd or if it was frustration. <laughs> I'm going to say it was a nice happy salute to the crowd that he, he'd gone quite well. <laughs> so here we wow. go. Our Final female athlete, Olga Kosek, uh, currently in third place in the overall. But like I said, Maya Ho Habian is not here. So even if she only gets a small way up this climb, she should jump into silver medal position. But obviously, we expect her to get all the way to the top. And then the question will be, how quick? <laughs> Olga has been on fire this year, um, competing in every round of the um, UIAA World Cups. Um, she's taken eighth place in Chongsong. Um, she also, she podiumed in the speed in the Champagne and came third. Uh, she came 11th in the lead. Um, and she came second last weekend in Glasgow in the European Cup. So. She really has been doing very well this season, which is why she sat in third place in the overall. I know she really fought for the speed in Chongsong as well, too. I think she got fourth, if I remember correctly, like just missing the podium. And I remember yeah. that was when the athletes had to redo some of the speed runs. And so she had a lot of uh, uh, climbing that day and, and really, I think, held her own and stayed incredibly strong. I know she's someone who also has a lot of competition experience um, and was fortunate to be able to be at uh, one of the first UIAA training camps earlier in the season in Brno, Czech Republic. And she was really someone who served as a mentor for other people there, especially newer climbers, noticing things and, and saying, hey, it seems like these are some types of movements that we may want to focus some more energy on or you know, can I give some feedback here? And um, so someone who also I think is is really willing to share her experience to help other people grow in the sport. Incredible. So uh, there was a UAAA training camp that was everybody invited to that? Oh. I, I think it was open to any athletes who, who wanted to go. Um, I, I believe it's a newer thing the UAAA is trying and um, thinking about how to continue to adapt it for the future, um, to have different opportunities to train 
across different mm-hmm. nations. That's a great idea. Get everybody together, learn off each other um, and expand the sport as well. Yeah, especially early in the season too, before things really heat up and people are doing more travel and maybe there's a little bit more stress from the competitions. I think that can sometimes make it a little bit harder to connect in the same way. Mm. Yeah, that is true. So Olga cruising her way, not using much time or energy, it seems, um, to get up to the ninth clip. Um, She will need to top if she wants to um, keep in the runnings for today's podium. However, Aneta Lujeka, who is in um, behind her in the overall, uh, only reached clip 10 uh, and hold 23. So actually, if she can do that, which she just has, <laughs> she has secured her position in the overall. Um, so Olga Kosek should easily place silver and Aneta Lujeka will be in third in the overall. So that is our overall women's podium confirmed. So now we are just looking for podium for today. Um, So keep on cheering at home. Keep on sending those positive vibes. Let's get Olga to the top and let's hope that she gets there in a really rapid time as well. But she does have to get to the top in an incredible five minutes 30 if she wants to take the gold medal which is possible because she's got to that platform very quickly. Yeah, she's got a great pacing going with just over three minutes left. It's going to be very, very close between these two. (laughs) I say between these two, there are uh, three other athletes who have topped, but I'm thinking, no! Oh, no! That is such a surprise! Wow. In that case, everything I just said about gold, silver and bronze in the overall might not be true. No, it still is true because she still has beaten Aneta Lusheka. So she does still get silver in the overall. Um, But she doesn't podium today. So looks like she might have just hurt her hip a little bit there. Hopefully she is okay. Absolutely brilliant performance still from Olga Kosek, but sadly not enough to get on the podium today because we have had a number of tops. We've had five tops in today's competition. So Marianne van der Steen, absolutely imperious, taking home the gold medal, both here and for the overall with a top in five minutes and 30. And then we have Eni Bertling in silver medal position uh, today. Um, with a 6.18 and Haruko Takuchi with a 6.21 also um, taking third place. Um, However, for the European Cup, that will get affected. Um, And then it will be Mira Alonso. But we will confirm all of that later when the men have also completed their competition because that is still going on. So let's jump back to their competition. We still have two athletes in the men. We have Kevin Linlau from the States. <laughs> Excited to see a teammate in the finals here. Yeah, I'm expecting people in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> Please feel free to get incredibly excited. It's, it's allowed. <laughs> I know Kevin also helped out recently with Ice Fest in Michigan in the States um, and uh, hosted a couple of clinics there, which had other even experienced uh, USA teammates who've competed for a few years. And they were saying how much they continue to still learn from Kevin. I know he just has a, a plethora of knowledge from his experience climbing. So a little hesitation on that hold, um, choosing not to use his hand on the volume, um, but still looking 
confident. He does just reach down and use his hand to press against that volume. And now looks confident again. Looks a little bit nervous through that lower section. I think it must be hard just knowing that you really, really don't want to fall in the lower section before you even get to your first proper clip. It must, that must feel quite a high pressure situation. Yeah, I think that can definitely impact someone's pacing. <laughs> it's like, just get past this bit. I just want to clip my first proper clip. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Straight away for the figure nine. So this section does seem to be all about speed, um, but it is all about whether you can get that next hold. But so far, everybody that has then moved away from that and done quite well has got there on their second or third attempt to get the next crimp. So how quickly can Kevin do it? <laughs> that was a great shot. You could see it much more clearly than you could in the earlier footage. And I, th I think that's because it is going dark behind. So you can really yeah. see that little um, metal sort of stub, <laughs> for want of a better word, um, that's protruding from the resin hold. Fantastic. So he got it on his second or third attempt there. So yeah. that's And you could see he was really intentional too about how he was placing his pick on that uh, that kind of nub, the metal nub, because a lot of times if you, you get it closer to kind of the top of the pick, it may feel like more secure, but it's actually less stable because that's kind of the wider part of the tool. And so um, more chance to push yourself off. So you could see he was kind of adjusting it to be closer to the beak or kind of the end of the pick where it's a little bit more secure. So he had good placement and very confident to get that hold, but now looks a little unsure how to move away from that hold. You said earlier about using bite tape. How difficult is it to actually hold the axe in your mouth like that? Um, I, not typically too difficult. Um, I do think there are times when it's possible you could have the tool in your mouth and then you know, you're trying to clip or something and the rope kind of gets uh, closer to, to the ax or tool than you would like. Um, mm. Or if you start to slip um, or you're around some of these, these features or volumes um, that are a little more awkward, um, sometimes that can make it a little bit more tricky. Um, and I think just as you can sometimes struggle with over gripping your tools if you're nervous or if you're in a precarious move, it is possible to kind of over grip with your teeth. So um, that's, you know, probably not very uh, dentist recommended, but uh, you know, whatever gets you through. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, dentists must watch this and just shiver. <laughs> <laughs> so Kevin has absolutely cruised his way into third place. Um, Kevin obviously not in the um, overall because he's from the States, uh, but he can podium here today. And will podium here today because there is only one more climber to go. Um, really smooth. So I say will. Yes, he will. He will. He's uh, in first place. So definite. But there is still the overall leader to come, Virgil Devin. So who knows what will happen? Almost two minutes still left on the clock for Kevin. Can he get any further along this barrel than anyone else has? I'm dying to see what happens at the end of the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> Come 
definitely taking his time to shake out a few different matches to kind of get himself set up to where he wanted to be as well. Hmm. It looks like Oof. this hold, you have to be super precise. It looks like the tiniest of little slots in Ooh, possibly resin, I'm not sure. But he's done it. He has got a whole hold further than anyone else has. <laughs> wow. Still looking incredibly smooth and strong. Yeah. So this could potentially make our maths a little bit tricky for the European overall. Um, but we'll just have to see how far Virgil gets. Um, but for now, let's appreciate. Oh, wow. he's <laughs> off. Appreciate <him. laughs> he's wow. off. Slams into the real ice wall there. Incredibly very... strong performance. <laughs> yeah, that was incredible. Hopefully very happy with that. Does currently sit in the gold medal position in the European Cup. Um, he is, of course, not from Europe. So uh, the other person that sits at the top of the table for the European Cup is Dennis Van Hook. He looks really tempted to use that large white volume with his hand, but then thought better of it and just pressed down, almost sort of mantled on the blue volume instead. Really solid footwork too, kicking into the the feature like that at such an angle can be, you really want to get your feet in there because if you're not figure fouring, then it's important that they don't rip out, especially as you're moving mm -hmm. through the next hold. So um, still requires core tension and, and being really intentional about that feet, those feet. Yeah. So. Let's just see what really exactly happened. Looks like his hands just slipped off. I wonder, just probably so pumped after moving through the roof as long as he did. I guess so. It is a very, very long roof here in Ulu. And look at that absolutely stunning footage as the uh, the sun sets here in Ulu. We do just have one more athlete to go and then we will crown our final overall and Ulu uh, European Cup winner. We don't know who that will be. It could be Virgil. It could be Dennis Van Hook. We will find out in the next few minutes. I can barely contain myself. Kevin Linlau <laughs> must barely be able to contain himself. And it doesn't even uh, actually affect him that much because he can't take the overall being, uh, being an American. <laughs> but he uh, will also be sort of hoping that, that he takes the gold. Um, I've just been sent a message that um, the team think that uh, it is now locked in, um, but I don't think it has. Uh, so Devin could still win, depending on how high he gets. So let's just wait and see what happens. Here he is, our final climber of the day and the current overall leader from the European Cup. It is Virgil Devin of France. Can he beat Kevin Lindlau's 9.19? And can he take the overall gold? So the crucial thing will be to look at whether he gets above Dennis Van Hook's 8.17. If he gets above that, then by my reckoning, he will have won the overall, but we will have to wait and find out exactly where he places. Really smooth, just went right into that hold. He really did. Blink and you miss it with uh, Virgil Devin. 
He's absolutely cruising this men's final so far. Choosing to cut loose quite a lot, um, but he's obviously got the core stability and uh, endurance to, to be okay with that. He will know how far he's got to go on this overhanging section. Oh, and skipping right ahead to the next hold. Yeah. Impressive. So just a couple more moves and he will be in third place um, in this Ulu um, round. but still a few more moves after that before he can claim the gold overall. Guy. His, my, oh, my heart was in my mouth as he released then. The release looked really, really big. <laughs> I thought he might come off on that move. The snow too kind of throws me off. <laughs> Not sure what's <laughs> yeah. falling. Wow. So Still he has is now in just under second. four minutes. Yeah. Come on, Virgil. Let's go for gold. I know Ryan probably wants Kevin to, to win, <laughs> but <laughs> there we go. He does take gold. He takes gold in both the Ulu European Cup round and in the overall European Cup. Congratulations, Virgil Devin. Let's hope he can get even further on this route and really impress the crowd and everyone at home. What an incredible show we have had today. So many twists and turns, so many calculations to make, but Virgil has been dominant through this season. And he's made me incredibly happy because he has gone all the way along the barrel and made it onto the next section. I was thinking about that. You'd been wanting that this whole time. So, you know, yeah. I think he is uh, very well deserved the, the gold here. Yeah, absolutely. And he's still got plenty of time left on the clock. So we might even see a top. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be quite the finish. <laughs> He's definitely got the time. He definitely does. It's easy for us to say. We're just sat at home enjoying the action. But we want a top now, please, Virgil. <laughs> <laughs> you've got double gold. You've got the uh, Ulu gold and you've got the overall gold. So now, please, we'd like a top. <laughs> so he's got the next clip. He's still got almost two minutes left on the clock, but a big sigh there from Virgil. He is getting tired. Yeah. The pump is setting in. But there isn't much more to go, so we may actually see a top on this men's final route. What an amazing job everybody has done here. Thank you very much to all of the setters, the volunteers, the organizers, the sponsors. It has been an absolutely incredible event in Ulu. And the setters really have done an amazing job. So thank you to them yeah. for coming all the way from Korea to do it as well. <laughs> and to your point, to have it range from the the youth all the way up to the adult and have it be... Uh, a route that can challenge each group is incredibly impressive. Yeah, absolutely. And Virgil is still just cruising on. And he's done it. Wow. Has he? No, he hasn't. <laughs> I celebrate. I mean, he has oh, done wow. it. He is. <laughs> but he hasn't got the top just yet. <laughs> I thought that was the last hold, but there is an exciting... Tell how it is. 
Uh, wow. Oh. Doesn't even hesitate. Doesn't even hesitate. One more hold and he will have done it. 20 seconds. He's almost there. Gotta get the clip. Gotta get the clip. Come on, oh, Virgil. No. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Come on. No. Oh, oh that was incredible absolutely performance. incredible. So good. Very, wow. very almost the top. Wow. He looks, <laughs> he looks happy with it and tired. Yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. We've already said how big a season this has been, how back-to-back -back a season this has been, and he has just absolutely dominated it today, cruising his way almost to the top when everybody else fell about halfway down the route. So absolutely incredible stuff from Virgil Devil. And, of course, does take the gold medal and the overall European Cup medal as well. I did think a couple of times that he was off further down the route, though. This Was it this release or the next? No, it was the next one. But uh, this release here, I really thought he was coming off here. <laughs> Heart in mouth moment. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just cruises through the rest of it just trying to hold on for dear life because of the pump but realistically making it look very very easy Just so that to show is how important it. pacing is <laughs> absolutely absolutely and it, he didn't really seem to slow down much he just seemed to keep a pretty consistent speed all the way through um, yeah. it really was an imperious performance from uh, Virgil Devin and a very, very, very well-deserved gold medal. So once Virgil's uh, replays are over, we will get to see all of the various uh, leaderboards, scoreboards from today. Um, because we did, of course, earlier on have the under-19s and the under-21s before we moved on into the Senior European Cup. So um, just to confirm, this, uh, these will be your results for the under-19 final. Um, so in the under-19 final, Jorge Viega Rodriguez took the gold medal with Tim Ziegler taking silver and Constantine Billy taking the bronze medal. Rory Watson from GBR taking fourth place. In the women's under-19 final, Lorena Beck took the gold medal, Tilda Quiekenverter took the silver medal, and Vilja Helen took the bronze medal with Kasia Ogilvy from GB taking fourth place. And in the under-21 final, we have Milan Pellissier taking the bron uh, gold medal, apologies, Erno Robert Sergi taking the silver, and Henok Garcia Montoya taking the bronze medal, with Ben Sfrigo Carminas from Hungary taking fourth place. And in the junior under-21 final, Selena Bossard absolutely cruised her way to the top, taking the gold medal, Caitlin Russell Connor taking silver, and Johanna Turi taking bronze. Now on to the men's European Cup final. Um, so to confirm, it was Virgil Devon in gold medal position, Kevin Landau Lau in silver medal position, and Dennis Van Hook in bronze medal, with Andreas Gantner from Liechtenstein taking fourth place. And in the women's uh, Ulu European Cup final, it was Marianne van der Steen in gold place, Eni Bertling in silver, Haruko Takeuchi in third, and Miro Alhonso taking the fourth position for Finland. And your overall cup results, it is Marianne van der Steen taking the gold from four Netherlands. It's Olga Kosek for Poland in silver and Aneta Luzeka from Czech Republic in third. 
Maiha sister Habjan from Slovenia taking fourth medal position because she was not able to compete today. And in the men's, Virgil Devin took gold with 340 points for France. Dennis Van Hook takes silver with 300 points for the Netherlands. And Basil Fettet takes bronze medal in the overall with 228 points for France, with David Buffard taking fourth place with 198 points for Romania. Absolutely huge congratulations to everybody who competed here in Ulu. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much to my co-commentator, Ryan, and we'll see you next year. Thanks.